All right. The hour of 6.30 having arrived, I will call to order the Common Council meeting of Tuesday, May 10th, 2022, and ask the clerk to call the roll. Alder Wahelia. Present. Alder Wahelia is present. Alder Abbas. Present. Alder Abbas is present. Alder Alvarez. Here. Alvarez is present. Alder Benford. Alder Benford. Present. Alder Benford is present. Alder Bennett is excused. Alder Carter. Carter. Alder Conklin. Present. Alder Conklin is present. Vice President Curry. Here. Vice President Curry is present. Alder Evers. Here. Evers is present. Alder Figueroa Cole. Here. Figure out Cole is here. Alder Foster. Here. Foster is here. President Furman. Present. President Furman is here. Alder Halverson. Present. Halverson is here. Alder Harrington McKinney. Harrington McKinney. Alder Heck. Here. Heck is present. Alder Lemmer. Here. Alder Lemmer is present. Alder Martin. Here. Martin is present. Alder Miadzi. Present. Alder Miadzi is present. Alder Verveer. Here. Alder Verveer Alder. is present. And Alder Vitiver. Present. Alder Vitiver is present. Alder Carter. And Alder Harrington McKinney. We do have quorum. Thank you. Uh, can we have the meeting instructions, please? Um, welcome to our virtual meeting. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link or calling the number in your original email. Members, if you're able, please activate your video and keep it on for the duration of the meeting. Staff, if you're able, please activate your video when you are speaking. All panelists have the ability to mute and unmute themselves. Please continue to use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak, ask questions, or request a roll call vote. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Members of the public who have registered to speak, the name you entered in Zoom must match the name you entered in registration. You will remain muted until called upon. City staff will tell you when your time is up. After speaking, a member of the council may ask you a question. If you need to share documentation with the Common Council, please send it to the email listed on today's agenda. Mayor, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just give my uh, customary reminder to us all that we're here to do our best uh, business for the City of Madison, and so I would invite everyone participating in this meeting, alders, staff, and registrants alike um, to just give each other a little grace and particularly to refrain from using any profanity in your remarks um, and to uh, try your best to assume good intentions. We'll start with item one, which is an honoring resolution, Legistar 71240, recognizing May as Asian Pacific Islander Desi American Heritage Month. And it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Alder Abbas. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, whereas the monk are, can, can everybody hear me? Okay, I just put a headphone, so I was not sure, so thank you. Whereas the Hmong are the diverse South Asian ethnic group who, whose roots can be traced back to many countries, including Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. And whereas during the Vietnam War, American War in Southeast Asia, secret war, from 1955 to 1975, countless Hmong cooperated with American Central Intelligence Agency and fought valiantly alongside United States of America and armed forces. And whereas Following the fall of Saigon and the withdrawal of the United States military in 1975, these uh, Hmong allies and their families were forced to flee their homes or face retaliation from communist regime. And whereas thousands of Hmong refugees resettled in the United States throughout the 1970s and 1980s and have spent the past decades contributing to the culture, historical, and economic fabric of those communities. And Whereas, Wisconsin has the third largest Hmong American population in the United States, making them the largest Asian ethnic group in the state. And whereas, in 2004, 
Wisconsin proclaimed its first Hmong Heritage Month, and whereas in 2022, on the 18th anniversary of Hmong Heritage Month, Wisconsin might continue to come together to remember the sacrifices made by and celebrated the culture of the Hmong people. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and the Common Council recognize April 2022 as Hmong Heritage Month in the city of Madison around the United States. Be it finally resolved that the city encourages and invite all residents to celebrate this month by learning more about the rich history and the culture of Hmong Americans and how their experiences and contribution have shaped our state and nation. Thank you, Alder. Unfortunately, that was the Hmong History Month for last month, not the Asian Pacific Islander Desi American Heritage Month for this month. Um, uh, but I believe you all have a copy of that. So perhaps we'll just take the motion from uh, Alder Abbas and the second from President Furman. Uh, and any discussion? If not, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of item one? Seeing none, we'll record that vote. We'll move on to disclosures and recusals. Um, are there any disclosures or recusals on items on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, that takes us to the consent agenda. President Furman. Thank you, Mayor. At this time, uh, a consent agenda uh, is moved uh, with recommendation action listed for each item on the agenda, including public hearings, except one, items which have registrants wishing to speak, two, items which require an extraordinary roll call vote and are not included on the consent agenda by unanimous consent, three, items which alders have separated out for discussion slash debate. The following items are extra majority items, Extra majority vote items will be recorded as unanimous votes unless a roll call or exclusion is requested. Agenda item 79, legislative file 70758, amending the police department's budget uh, to accept uh, $20,000 in funding from the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. Report of finance committee, 15 reports, uh, 15 votes required. Uh, agenda item 81, legislative file 70872 amending the capital budget to transfer uh, 265,000 uh, geo borrowing from the reconstruction street program to right away landscaping program to allow for a conversion of medians with planting bed to turf and concrete. Um, we have a substitute actually that we'll be looking at and I think maybe that's uh, in the uh, consent agenda uh, again uh, later. Um, uh, 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 agenda item 82, legislative file 70887, authorizing the amendment of the 2020 water utility capital uh, budget to include 425,000 of additional budget authority for engineering services in support of uh, bench scale pilot testing and alternative analysis and preliminary and final design for well 15 PFAPS treatment facility and authorization to proceed with sole source award of engineering services to EECOM, an amount not to exceed 375,000. Report of the Finance Committee, 15 votes required. Agenda item 84, uh, legislative file 70, Nine, uh, 70915, amending the 2020 uh, adopted operating budget uh, for assessor to transfer 35,000 from direct appropriations contingency reserve and the general fund uh, to assessors purchase service budget and authorizing the city to retain outside counsel on a non-competitive basis to assist the city attorney in representing the city's interests in property tax litigation with section 42 housing developments, which are challenging their 2020 real property tax assessment. Report of finance committee, 15 votes required. Um, legislative file, uh, so uh, sorry, agenda item 90, legislative file 70986. Uh, accepting a $2 million grant from the Wisconsin Department of Administrative Neighborhood Investment Fund Grant Program to support the financing of costs related to the Bayview Foundation's Triangle Redevelopment 
involving a community center and housing, amending the community development division's 2020 adopted capital budget to receive and use those funds and authorize the mayor and city clerk to sign an agreement and complete any other necessary documents with the state of Wisconsin to carry out the intent of the reward, the award report of finance committee, 15 votes required. Authorizing the city to accept, uh, so I'm sorry, uh, agenda item 91, legislative file 70987, authorizing the city to accept $75,000 in matching funds from Dane County to support the costs of a consultant-led effort to update the community plan to prevent and end homelessness, amending the Community Development Division's 2022 operating budget to reflect the receipt of these funds and uh, commiserate expenditures and authorize the Community Development Division to issue an RFP to solicit proposals from organizations to provide consultant services. Report of the Finance Committee, 15 votes required. Um, agenda item 92, legislative file number uh, 70988, directing city engineering staff to proceed with renovations to the structure located at 20, uh, 02 Zaire Road, necessary to convert it to temporary use as a shelter for single men experiencing homelessness and amending the city's 2022 adopted capital budget to authorize an additional $500,000 of general obligation borrowing to complete this work. Report of the Finance Committee, 15 votes required. Just want to make sure I'm reading the right version of the document. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so, uh, agenda items part of the consent agenda with additional recommendations as noted. Um, agenda item number four, legislative file number 69517. Um, this is a substitute um, having to deal with um, uh, creating sections 28.002-0045 of the Madison General Ordinance to change the zoning of the property located at 2007 Roth Street, 12th Automatic District. Um, this is going to, uh, the recommendation is to refer this, the second substitute to the plan commission on uh, June 13th, and then come back to the common council on June 21st. Agenda item number five, legislative file 69538, an alternative creating section 28.022-0045 of the Madison General Ordinance to change the zoning of the property located at 702 Ruskin Street, 12th Automatic District. Um, also a, um, so this would be referred back to our council meeting on uh, uh, June 21st. Agenda item number six, legislative file 69519, amending the city of Madison official map to establish map reservation for future streets and highways in the city of Madison consistent with the recommendations in the adopted Oscar Meyer special area plan. Um, recommended action refer substitute the transportation policy and planning board on June 6th, plan commission on June 13th, and the common council on June 21st. Uh, agenda item number 21, legislative file 70655, creating section 28 dot 022-00560 of the Madison General Ordinance to rezone property located at 2165 Linden Avenue, 15th Aldermatic District. Um, the report of the plan commission um, uh, is this, this is intended to, on here to make it clear that this does require um, 15 votes uh, due to a protest petition. Um, there was an error on our agenda where it did not make that clear, so we're making it clear here. Um, uh, agenda item number 24, legislative file 70998, appeal of the plan commission action on a conditional use request for 3734 Speedway Road. Um, legislative item uh, 69786, um, this would require 14 votes to overturn the plan commission action. Agenda item 32, legislative file 71024. Um, standing in solidarity with immigrant families and calling upon President Biden to abolish 287G and pass citizenship for all. This is uh, correcting an agenda error that did not make it clear that, that this requires adoption under suspension of the rules. Um, agenda item 52, legislative file 68608, um, second substitute, creating a section 23.65 of the Madison General Ordinance to prohibit com commercial selling of cats or dogs for the purpose of experimentation, and also amending section 1.083A of the Madison General Ordinance to update or revise bell deposit for violations. 
Then uh, also amending section 1.084 to provide the Director of Public Health, Madison Dane County Enforcement Authority to issue citations for viol violations. Therefore, um, this is going to be referred to uh, Public Health um, on June 1st and back to the Common Council on June 7th. Agenda item 69, legislative file 70982, awarding public contract number 9172, uh, 2022 inclusive playgrounds, um, report, uh, report of public works, engineering division, re recommended action placed on file without prejudice. Agenda item 73, legislative file 69990, amending section 33.13.2 to establish procedures for hiring of the Common Council Chief of Staff. Uh, recommended action is to place this on file without prejudice. Uh, agenda item 74, legislative file 70055, amending section 33.13.2 of the Madison General Ordinance to specify hiring and supervision of Common Council office staff. Recommended action, place on file without prejudice. Agenda item 81, legislative file 70872, amending the 2022 adopted budget to transfer uh, uh, 265,000 uh, geo borrowing uh, from uh, reconstruction street programs, the right of way landscaping program. Um, the purpose is to, uh, the recommended action is to adopt a substitute and it requires 15 votes. Um, Agenda item 111, legislative file 71289, amending section 2.033 and 2.034 to re revise the process for filing, uh, for filling Common Council vacancies. Um, this is adding a referral to the Common Council Executive Committee on May 24th. Agenda item 112, amending section 2.041D of the Madison General Ordinance to remove reference to public comments and hearings as special order of business. Um, this is an agenda correction and it's adding the, um, a referral to the Common Council meeting on 524. Um, agenda item 113, legislative file 71317, amending section 2.0295 of the Madison General Ordinance regar re regarding public comment uh, at Common Council meetings. This is also uh, fixing um, an error on the agenda and adding a ref by adding a referral to the Common Council on May 24th. Agenda item 114, legislative file 71318, amending section 2.0553 of the Madison General Ordinance to exclude referrals without consent of lead sponsor from the consent agenda. Also an agenda correction, um, adding the referral to the Common Council on May 24th. Agenda item 115, uh, City of Madison uh, legislative file 70637, City of Madison committing to the five principles of responsible outdoor lighting and strengthening lighting ordinance. Um, the sponsors are postponing introduction of this item until a future meeting. Agenda item 122, legislative file 71167, incorporating health and safety goals, strategies, and actions into the city's performance excellence framework. Um, as per staff instructions, um, the recommended action here is that we're removing the referral to the Transportation Commission. Agenda item 130, um, adopting uh, the Metro uh, legislative file 71227, adopting the Metro, Netro, Met, Metro Network redesign uh, plan. Um, this is adding another um, referral to the Transportation Policy Planning Board on May 31st due to the fact that they will be holding a hearing that day about this item. Additional agenda items with recommendations made from the floor. Um, agenda item 23, legislative file 70956. So the substitute creating section 15.01629 of the Madison General Ordinance entitled City Boundaries and, and being part of the chapter entitled Alder Districts and Wards attaching to the 20th Alder District, the property located at 3262 High Point Road in the town of Middleton, amending section 1502. 148140 of the Madison General Ordinances to attach the property to Ward uh, 148140, assign a permanent zoning classification of suburban residential uh, consistent District 1 SRC1. Um, the Plan Commission recommendation was to adopt the second substitute. Um, items for exclusion. Um, uh, Item uh, 11 on our agenda, legislative file 70259, a public hearing for a new license at Liberty Square gas station. It's a class A 
beer license, uh, class A liquor, and uh, Aldermatic District 17. Um, and now we have items that are being introduced from the floor for referral. Uh, legislative file 71355, amending the title of section uh, 33.13, amending section 33.13.1, and repealing section 33.13.2 related to the Common Council Executive Committee. Um, this would be referred to the Executive Committee on May 24th and come back to the Council on the 24th as well. Uh, legislative file number uh, 71357, creating section 3.035 related to the Common Council Office and Chief of Staff. This is being referred to the Common Council Executive Committee on May 24th and coming back to the Council on May 24th as well. And then uh, legislative file number 71395, by title only, appointing placeholder um, as an alder for District 3 until spring 2023 20, election. Um, this is going to be referred to the Special Common Council meeting on May 17th um, and come back to the Council on May 24th. All right, that was a lot. There's more. Um, are there any other items that alders would like to have excluded from the consent agenda at this time? Alder Conklin. Uh, yes, Mayor. I need item number 71, Legislar number 71037 to be pulled and I'll make a motion at, that, at the later time, correct? Yep. Thank you. Uh, Alder Wahilahe. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would like to pull item number 28, register file number 71242, Alder Committee Appointment for Finance and Public uh, Plan Commission. And I'll speak to that. All right. Any other items that Alders would like to have excluded from the consent agenda? Going once, going twice. Alder Carter? Alder, you're muted. Yeah, I, yes, I know. <laughs> yes, I like to pull um, item 33, Legistar 71102. Okay. Alder Halverson. Yes, Madam, thank you. Agenda 81 70872. 81? Correct. All right. Just a minute on that one. Any additional items, Alder Abbas? Yeah, it's, it's not the exclusion. I just want to make sure my name is written as a sponsor on agenda item number 32 and 82. Uh, make sure the clerk adds Alder Abbas as a sponsor on item 32 and 82. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I have questions. Um, was um, uh, item number 21, was that on the exclusion list? It that is. Yes, Alder, it is. And um, uh, 28 was on the exclusion list. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, was 62 and 63? Uh, those are new. 62. 70899 and 70916. That's 62 and 63. Okay. Um, was uh, item number 98 excluded? Yes. Okay. Uh, 96 and 77, were they excluded? 96 and 77, yes. And my final one was uh, 106, 71014. 106. Okay. I'm complete. Thank you, Alder. Alder Miadze? Uh, yes, item uh, 
8270887. Item 82. Okay. Any additional items that alders would like to have excluded from the consent agenda? Let me remind you that we will not be excluding public hearing items unless there's a registrant or you request it at this time, which is a new practice. Any additional items? All right, let's go over that one more time just to make sure we've got it. Uh, all right, so the following items are extra majority agenda items 79. Oh, wait, now I have to adjust my list a little bit here. 79-84-90-91 are all extra majority, then will be recorded as unanimous. Uh, we have additional recommendations on uh, items four and five where the action will be. Uh, so on number four, the action is to refer the second substitute to plan commission and then back to the council on the 21st of June. On item five, the action is to refer to the council on the 21st of June. Um, on Item 32, uh, the recommendation is to adopt under suspension. On item 52, the recommendation is to refer back to the Board of Public Health on June 1st and then to the Council on June 7th. On 69, the recommended action is to place on file without prejudice. On 73, the recommended action is to place on file without prejudice. On 74, same act recommendation, place on file without prejudice. On uh, 111, the action is to refer to CCEC on the 24th. 112, Refer to council on the 24th, 113, same action, council on the 24th, as is 114, uh, which is to, re to refer to council on the 24th. Uh, 115 will be delayed for introduction at a future meeting. Uh, 122, the action is to remove the referral to the Transportation Commission on. 525. And on 130, the uh, recommended action is an additional referral to the Transportation Policy and Planning Board on 531. And item 23, uh, the recommended action is to adopt the second substitute. Okay. So, uh, Alder, Alder Halverson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just to confirm, <clears throat> item 111 is an additional referral to CCEC, and then it's still going to go to the council uh, on the 24th. Correct. Thank you. Uh, all right. So then the items that will be excluded from the consent agenda tonight are items 3, 6, 11, 21, 24, 28, 33, 62, 63, 71, 77, 81, 82, 92, 96, 98, and 106. I'll do that again. 3, 6, 11, 21, 24, 28, 33, 62, 63, 71, 77, 81, 82, 92, 98, excuse me, 82, 92, 96, 98, and 106. 
Um, also uh, excluded from the consent agenda tonight are introductions of legislative file numbers 71355, 71357, 71395. Anything additional for the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, President Furman. Move adoption. Yeah. It's moved and seconded to adopt the consent agenda. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of the consent agenda and that dispenses with a number of pages. All right, I will note uh, one other thing. We need to take up item 96 before we take up item 21. So without objection, uh, we'll do that. Seeing no objection. All right. That's the consent agenda. So then we will go to public comment. I'll just refresh here to make sure. Our first item for public comment is item three, uh, which is Legistar 70694 regarding uh, Toke Boulevard resurfacing assessment district. Our first registrant on item three is Ken from District 11 to be followed by Yvonne Ramos. Hi there, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, so I live along uh, Toke Boulevard and um, I uh, am in favor of the revised uh, plan, which I, um, I was very thankful that Alder Martin was uh, listening to a different input of people who live along the street. And she was uh, very helpful in uh, coordinating with um, the mayor's office, engineering forestry, with coming up with a plan which had offered some parking along the side. Um, so I'm in favor of that option of allowing for more parking. It does allow for more trees to be planted along the, the North Eastman. So, um, so just wanted to say that I'm in favor of that. Um, I think I would have preferred a little bit more parking farther down the street, but I really appreciate that they came up with an alternative plan. So I'm in favor of the revised plan. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Yvonne Ramos of District 11. Uh, there's no one by that name in the list. All right. And our next item is agenda item number four, uh, which is uh, creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning at 2007 Roth Street. And just a reminder that the um, motion on number, oh, I'm sorry, there's only people available for questions on number four. Sorry, 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 sorry. Keep scrolling. Uh, item number six is our next item. Uh, this is a substitute amending the official map to establish future streets in the city consistent with the recommendations in the adopted Oscar Mayer special area plan. Um, I will remind us on this item that the recommendation is, uh, I believe, to refer this item. Um, but we do have registrants wishing to speak, uh, starting with Jennifer Argelander of District 12 to be followed by Christine Elholm. Uh, Mayor, neither of those names are in the list. Uh, do we have then Melissa Huggins of District yes. 6? Uh, good, after, good evening, everyone. Melissa Huggins from Urban Assets. I'm representing um, Lincoln Avenue Capital on this um, project. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the collaboration that went into the alternative that you have before you for the Roth, Ruskin, and now Coolidge um, street mapping. Um, this was a result of a collaboration of the Friends of Hartmeyer and, and Lincoln Avenue Capital that um, Alder Abbas was, was able to facilitate and 
all parties discussed um, what would be best and, and this is what is the result. Uh, the new alignment allows for an acre increase in the conservation area, which pleases um, the friends of uh, Hartmeyer. And, and then it also vastly improves the site for the development of two affordable housing projects over the previous um, street uh, alternative. So we um, greatly appreciate uh, staff's leadership and work on this alternative. It was uh, took all, all hands on deck to get this to you tonight. And we uh, strongly re support referral to plan commission and TPPB for review and approval and look forward to um, final approval at your June 21st meeting. Thank you. Thank you. There are no further registrants on this one. Are there questions of the registrant? All right. Then our next item is item 21 which is creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to rezone 2165 Linden Avenue. Our first registrant on item 21 is Ed Niles of District 6 to be followed by Tyler Krupp. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Can folks hear me? Yes. So uh, Mayor Alders, neighbors, uh, my name is Ed Niles. I actually live on Linden Avenue. I'm speaking tonight in strong support of the proposed change in zoning from TRV1 to PD at 2165 Linden Avenue to advance the development of a multifamily building on that site. Uh, that's item 21 on your agenda and the associated update to our neighborhood plan, which is in item 96. Um, we really need to support smart, green, forward-looking infill developments like this one, which would increase density and add to the housing supply in a neighborhood which quite frankly desperately needs it. This project represents an incredibly good land use for an available underused utilized parcel like Mount Zion Church, which has reached its end of life and is already adjacent to dense mixed use buildings on a main road and is within a highly walkable neighborhood in the city supported by upgraded utilities, conveniently close to BRT and bike infrastructure that the city's already made investments in. Um, additionally, neglecting to update our neighborhood plan, regardless of this particular project, with guidance for an institutional site like Mount Zion Church Parcel, which has already been sold and will certainly be repurposed, would quite frankly be irresponsible. Um, tonight's final approval by the council will be the end of a long journey of about 12 months of engagement by a threshold development with the neighborhood and other stakeholders to try to bring about a development project that's both fiscally responsible environmentally friendly and meets the many needs and wants uh, of a diverse uh, neighborhood. Many, many, many neighborhood meetings, surveys, Zoom meetings, discussions under the existing SASE Neighborhood Association structure have been held over those 12 months, providing ample opportunities for feedback on this project by both those who oppose and support it and the associated neighborhood plan amendment. Uh, just as a reminder, the UDC, the Urban Design Commission has had multiple opportunities to review and provide feedback, including hearing uh, from many, many folks who support and oppose the project, uh, not once, but twice. And they ultimately noted that the project is an appropriate mass and size for the neighborhood and is fully eligible for a PD zoning status. The plan commission was also voted unanimously to recommend approval by the council after a full airing to address any and all remaining concerns. So both the amendment to the neighborhood plan and the project plan submitted for approval have been through multiple revisions based on the feedback from our neighborhood, including intense feedback from any who might register in opposition tonight. Um, for those who haven't been following the project closely, just to sum it up, I wanna make it abundantly clear that there have been many opportunities for all the neighbors and stakeholders to make their voice heard throughout this process. And it's something we should be encouraging, uh, not discouraging by developers in the city. Given the massive deficit in our housing supply in the city and particularly in the Sassy neighborhood, I encourage you to move with all haste in approving this exceptional project. I wanna thank you for your time and my wife and I look forward to welcoming our new neighborhood neighbors into the neighborhood in the very near future. And that's time. Thank you. Our next registrant is Tyler Krupp of District 6 to be followed by Bruce Becker. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, members of the Common Council, thank you for your time and consideration. My name is Tyler Krupp. I'm the developer for the proposed redevelopment at 2165 Linden Street. I'm also a neighbor to the project. Um, my wife and I rent directly across the street. Uh, this project has stirred strong emotions and nearly a year of public discussion. 
I want to acknowledge that this is a complex project and reasonable people can certainly disagree on the overall merits of what's been proposed. That said, I think it's really important that we bring awareness to the stories that we tell about this project to ourselves and to each other. The stories we tell can open up or close down possibilities. Opponents of this project would have us believe that this project is the same old story of an unresponsive developer in pursuit of maximum profits using whatever tools and workarounds are needed to get a desired outcome. This story doesn't ring true to many of us who are familiar with the project and process. I'd suggest it closes down some really interesting and beautiful possibilities. I invite you to consider an alternative story, one that's far more complex and interesting that opens up new possibilities amongst us. Consider for a moment that the story of this project might also be a heartening example of diverse folks with different interests coming together in a concerned way to thoughtfully and carefully address the unique circumstances of this site to make the best of a challenging situation for the good of our community. That's been my experience. A church, a church in need reaches out for help so that they might responsibly transition and expand, expand their service mission. A developer knowing the complexities of the site agrees to take on the process out of a commitment to the neighborhood. Engaged neighbors, three separate elders, church members embark on a nearly year long conversation to discover together what might be done with the site that's responsive to many needs. The project that results is certainly no one's ideal. Rather, it's a balanced compromise, perhaps even frustrating to everyone involved. The compromise skillfully avoids the worst outcomes while doing much good. The church will have resources to continue their community service. The developer took a risky leap into cutting edge sustainable passive house building and moved towards more relational forms of community engagement. The neighborhood achieved a moderated density and scale that responsibly transitions from higher density to single family. Together, we've skillfully responded to broader social needs, including Madison's housing shortage, environmental sustainability, and more democratic forms of local politics. Consider that this way of doing things may actually be a new way of doing things together. Consider that how the Common Council decides this matter sends clear signals to those who've risked this new way. I invite you, the Common Council members, to join us in this alternative story. I'm grateful to all those who've given their energies to this process thus far. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Our next registrant is Bruce Becker of District 15 to be followed by Barbara Becker. Uh, Bruce, if you could unmute yourself. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Well, obviously the plan commission uh, sent this forward, uh, even though uh, during discussions during the plan commission meeting that concessions would have to be met or be have to be made. Uh, even though it was clear that a rezoning recommendation to PD is contrary to coded law and contrary to the city comprehensive plan, it was still sent forward. Now, the, con uh, the conversations were based on the developer's claim that the development would be green, although there's, uh, there was some confusion about what they intended, uh, that, that what they thought that green meant. So allowances uh, are made uh, Allowances are made in code, of course, to permit uh, developments that are green to uh, be rezoned to plan development if that's necessary to achieve the uh, green development. But in this case, uh, we're dealing with a blank slate. Rezoning is not necessary to build green. And there's plenty of opportunity to provide higher density here and also uh, owner occupied and meeting the middle, uh, missing middle. So the development, the density uh, is, the density of this is just huge uh, compared to the surrounding buildings. And I think you're gonna hear more of that later. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Our next registrant is Barbara Becker of District 15 to be followed by Terry Kahn. Hi. Yeah, um, yep. Go ahead, Barbara. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Three minutes isn't a lot of time to make a case. So many of us concerned with the import of this proposed development have addressed you by email with significant detail. And we hope those comments inform your decisions. We find this application faulty for a number of reasons outlined in those comments. I think our number one concern is that the proposed development is not transitional to the residential neighborhood. 
Pictures of the surrounding residential structures are found in file 70655 under number three, demolition photos. Division, Linden, and Dunning are not at Wood Avenue. This development, which might find an appropriate home elsewhere and be welcomed on its merits, would stand here in stark contrast and not in transition to its surroundings. We are not anti-density and not anti-renter, but believe the city should embrace this unique opportunity to fill this site with an appropriately sized structure or structures made available for home or condo buyers rather than landlords. This can be accomplished within the current zoning parameters or change to permit something within the low medium residential designation in the comp plan, but it should not completely skip a comp plan designation by going from low residential to medium residential when the vast majority of surrounding properties are low residential. By definition, that is not transitional. And using the neighborhood plan by constructing an amendment to work around the comp plan does not seem like a good planning practice. Using the neighborhood plan to affect a zoning change to benefit one plan for one site by one developer seems backward to us. Rather, the city can look at the site as a blank slate and develop a plan for this site and others like it in the future. The council can recognize the need for development of this parcel while at the same time preserving the character of the neighborhood into which it will be received. We urge you to reject items 21 and 96 to pursue appropriately sized development on this site and to fill the need for housing available for ownership. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Our next registrant is Terry Kahn of District 6 to be followed by Sandy Blakeney. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I live at 2135 Linden Avenue, and I urge you to oppose items 21 and 96. The neighbors fully understand how expensive the housing is in our neighborhood, and the overwhelming majority of the 70 who responded to a survey do not see a rezone for higher density necessary. This is not purely because of the mass. We are interested in providing first-time homeowners with an option to invest. We would have gladly spent the time if the church in Alder had notified us that the church was vacating to search for a socially responsible developer to build with an option for some affordable units. We know that 32 units will not solve the density crisis in the city. Our desires are to allow for increased diversity in the neighborhood over increased high rent density with the majority of units not conducive to any more than couples. This is another luxury apartment in our neighborhood. Neighbors have spent an immense amount of time in meetings, educating ourselves on ordinances, the comp plan, passive house, and PDs. We have written detailed letters and spoken at public meetings, citing the numerous faults in the proposal, not meeting the purpose and standards of a PD. To allow this proposal to be granted a PD is to believe that ordinances are meaningless. We have educated ourselves on spot zoning regarding this PD. The classic definition Definition being the process of singling out a small parcel of land for a use classification totally different from that of the surrounding area for the benefit of the owner of such property and the, to the detriment of other owners. Spot zoning is, in fact, often thought of as the very antithesis of plan zoning. When considering spot zoning, courts will generally determine whether the zoning relates to the compatibility of the zoning of the surrounding uses. Perhaps the most important criteria in determining spot zoning is the extent to which the disputed zoning is consistent with the municipality's comprehensive plan. Item 96, the hastily drawn up neighborhood plan amendment allowed no input from the community. The Alders did not set up any forums for discussion or explanation with the neighborhood. This was not on the agenda or discussed by the neighborhood association. We have come to learn that its only purpose is for the single parcel for a particular development that, de that benefits the developer in order to comply with the comp plan, as the comp plan currently cannot legally be touched. We know that comp plans must have public input, so we assume a neighborhood plan amendment would as well. Both the process as to how we learned about this amendment and the purpose for which it was written has wide city citywide implications. Is this the new way to amend a comp plan? To allow this amendment to be approved with no input means that the comp plan for future land use is meaningless. We take ordinances, the comp plan, and neighborhood plan amendments seriously. This is a typical zoning compliant lot that could be sensitively developed under its current zoning with increased density. I urge you to oppose both items 21 and 26, and thank you for the time. Thank you. Our next registrant is Sandy Blakeney. 
of District 6 to be followed by Madeline Gotkowitz. Uh, Sandy, you should see a prompt to unmute. Again, Sandy, I cannot unmute. There you go. Great technical difficulties. You can hear me okay now? Yep. Yes. Okay. Th thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm here tonight to ask the council to deny the application for zoning change and to deny the draft neighborhood plan amendment. As a neighbor of this parcel, I've hoped that whatever is built in place of the former church would be affordable for people with average incomes, would offer opportunities for home ownership to people who typically are excluded from that possibility and would integrate well with the surrounding neighborhood in terms of scale, density, and design. This is a fabulous neighborhood and a wide diversity of people should be able to have the opportunity to live here. This proposal does none of those things. In addition, it was brought to light late in this process that approval of the PD requires that the proposal be consistent with the city's comp plan. There's a clear inconsistency between the proposed development and the COP plan. So at the last minute, this neighborhood plan amendment was drafted as an obvious workaround to the problem of non-compliance. There's an assumption in state law that the city's comprehensive plan and any proposed updates to it will include public participation in evaluating those updates. This draft neighborhood plan amendment doesn't meet that requirement. In fact, the alders supporting this amendment never held a single neighborhood meeting about the legal requirement to make sure the proposed higher density development was consistent consistent with the comp plan or to discuss the viability and benefits of amending a 22 year old neighborhood plan. As you read in a letter from former Alder and Common Council President Marsha Rummel, this draft neighborhood plan amendment appears to engage in a type of spot zoning by describing the exact height, scale, density and setbacks that the developer needs in order to proceed with their planned redevelopment at this site. The amendment discusses institutional sites that are embedded in residential neighborhoods and tries to both address this specific site and also provide general policy guidance. The issue of sites like the Zion Church reaching the end of their useful life how development decisions should be considered for those sites is a policy question that Madison needs to discuss. However, using this draft amendment to the neighborhood plan appears only to serve to try to push through an otherwise unapprovable zoning change. Allowing this to occur without discussing the implications of this approach to addressing policy questions about land uses will affect the entire city, not just one half of one block. I ask the council to reject the zoning change and the neighborhood plan amendment, and I thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Our next registrant is Madeline Gottkowitz of District 15 to be followed by Rebecca Labou. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Alders, I, um, I thank you for your time and effort in considering these public comments. I'm speaking against items 21 and 96 on the, tonight's agenda. The Shank Atwood Neighborhood Plan Amendment 1 is attached to your agenda. It shows my home at the corner of Linden and Division Streets, about 26 feet north of the Zion Faith Community Church parking lot. As a neighboring property owner, I fully support the systematic development of the church parcel. However, the current proposal for a change in zoning necessitates amending the neighborhood plan. While I respect their efforts, and quite contrary to stories told to you a few minutes ago by others, I offer that neither Alder Benford nor Alder Foster has held a public meeting to introduce and explain the neighborhood plan amendment to me and my neighbors, nor have they solicited our comments on the proposed plan amendment. The proposals before you tonight prioritize the desires of the Zion Faith community and their business partners, rather than following a process that recognizes multiple points of view. Rezoning the church parcel to permit a relatively large and the only three-story apartment building on a TRV1 zone street should be a really heavy lift for the current property owners and their business partners, not simply achieved by avoiding vetting changes to the neighborhood plan to gain approval of their proposal. I urge you instead to visit the new Marling building in the houses opposite along East Washington and East Main Streets. The Marling provides a lovely example of new development appropriately scaled to adjacent older homes that are similar to those that abut the Zion Church. 
At the Marling development, East Main Street is about 20% wider than Linden, Dunning, and Division Streets, but the scale of the Marling along East Main is much smaller than that provo proposed for the Zion Church property. The Marling has two-story townhomes with about a 20-foot step back to three stories. At the Zion parcel, the developers propose only a four to eight foot step back to the third floor. Housing can be increased in our neighborhood and this can be accomplished by adding fewer than the 32 units currently proposed for this church property. This can be accomplished through a process that puts neighborhood plans and zoning changes ahead of before the council approving a specific development. I ask that you consider the scale of this proposal relative to the light-filled area of East Main at the Marling development. A similar appropriately scaled development should and can be achieved at the Zion property, but not through this process and the current proposal. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next registrant is Rebecca Labou of District 15 to be followed by Will Akowitz. Hi, my name is Rebecca, and I'm here today to voice my support for the London Avenue development. I am really excited to add my voice as a renter in the neighborhood. I've lived in Sassy for five years as a renter in the first floor of an older home just a couple blocks away from the proposed development. I feel really lucky to live in such a vibrant and connected neighborhood. But in those five years, my rent has gone up despite no material changes to the apartment. When I first rented it, it was a two bedroom, a little over $1,000. It's now going for close to 1,500 with no material changes. And this is an old building with no air conditioning, peeling paint in the windows and very little insulation with a $200 heating bill in the winter. There's very little supply in the rental market and costs keep going up year after year. And it's only going to get worse as more and more people move to Madison and drive up demand. If we could, my wife and I would buy a house and live in Sassy long-term because we love this neighborhood we actually can't afford to buy anything in the neighborhood. The cheapest home listed right now is under a thousand square feet for $350,000. And that's gonna go for over 380K. That's a mortgage of over 2,500 a month if you can even put 20% down. And we can't afford that making almost twice Madison's median household income, which is a very, very privileged position to be in. How are most people in Madison going to survive this rental market, survive this home market, and who is actually going to be able to thrive in Sassy if we don't build more housing here? This is the reality. It's just not affordable for most people in Madison to live in Sassy, and it's only going to get worse, especially if we don't build more housing. And if the city wants to apply an equity lens, the people who lose out are the people who rent, who have lower incomes, and who are disproportionately people of color, not people who already own half a million dollar homes in Sassy. Not even first-time home buyers, when the average cost of the home is over $375,000. I think that affordable housing is an essential and critical need in Madison. I would love to see more affordable housing go up in my neighborhood, but that shouldn't stop us from also approving this market rate building, because we need it all. We need affordable housing, and we need market rate housing, and we need townhomes and more. We need more housing in all its forms, because we just don't have enough for people to have any sort of choice. And yes, we need denser housing, because we are a city, and we're going to continue to need denser residential areas and popular neighborhoods to support our city's growth. I was eight years old when the neighborhood plan was developed. We should be thinking about the present needs of our city, not blindly following this plan from two decades ago. You all are a common council who represents all of Madison, not just the minority of homeowners who have the privilege to be the loudest voices in opposition. And the reality for everyone in Madison is that it's becoming more and more unaffordable as a place for the, to live for the average person. The city is growing rapidly and we need more development to keep up with the demand. Yes, we need more affordable housing. Yes, we need market rate housing like this building. No, this building is not going to solve the affordable housing crisis, but it's a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is uh, Will Ochowitz. Tell me if I'm pronouncing that right. Of District 6, representing Madison is for People, to be followed by Mary Thompson Shriver. Yeah, it's uh, Ovich. Um, Ovich, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, hello, Alders. I'm here today representing Madison is for People. We're a local YIMBY group. Um, I live in Tiny Lapham on the other side of the Isthmus. And like Rebecca, I too would like to stay in my neighborhood. I'm currently a renter. I'd love to buy a home or a condo and be able to stay. But unfortunately, it's just too expensive. Now, you heard some of the neighbors talk about the project. They said it was too big. They said it's out of character with the neighborhood. Well, 
there's more to a neighborhood's character than just the form and outline of a building. Neighborhood character is the bookkeeper who opens a book, a room of one's own. It's the barista who makes a latte. It is the people who work and live in Madison. And a neighborhood is not a static object that should remain in place, remain the same way it has been for years. It is something that should grow and change just like the people who live and work in it. I've also heard about the concerns about affordability. And it's true that this is a market rate building. But if you deny this rezone, you are not even giving people the opportunity to pay to stay in Sassy. You are telling them that their money is no good and that they should go somewhere else. And the people who live in that building are real. They just don't know who they are yet. And if that building is, if this building is not approved, then those people will go somewhere else. And someone is effectively forced out of Madison, either through displacement or by cost of living. I am urging you to support this project. The Plan Commission supports the rezoning, the Urban Design Commission supports the rezoning, and the developer has spent a year working with neighbors on the project. If we are saying that you are, if we are telling developers and builders that over a year of work is not worth enough to build new homes, then what kind of signal are we sending? Are we saying that we're serious about the housing crisis? Or are we saying that we'd rather keep things the same and search for the perfect solution? Thank you, Alders. Thank you. Our next registrant is Mary Thompson Shriver of District 15 to be followed by Eric Halverson. Here, there's no one by that name in the list. Eric is here. All right, then Eric Halverson of Cottage Grove to be followed by Brenda Halverson. Hello, this is Eric. Um, I'm the co-president of the Common Grace Board, and I'd like to give you a little background of how we got here. Over the last decade, declining membership and a lack of disposable income has put financial strain on our faith community. We've tightened our financial belts over the years by reducing expenses, such as turning down the heat, reducing staff to only the pastor, cutting his wages, and selling our pipe organ to provide cash flow and pay off our only debt. The building is in need of major upkeep. However, we don't have the money to make those repairs. We've made several attempts to work with different developers to build affordable housing with the intent of Zion occupying space within the new building. After an initial discussion with a developer that has several properties on the east side, the property was not a viable location due to the due to the density requirements of the project. Zoning played a major role in this conclusion. Most recent conversations with another affordable housing developer ended in late 2019 when we could not get terms or guarantees in, in writing. The offer to purchase gave us non-exclusive rights and limited access to the designated space and thereby, thereby restricted our ability to meet our faith family's needs. Several attempts were made to get more favorable terms to protect Zion's interests. All were rejected. After a year or so of conversations between the leadership at Lake, Lakeview Moravian Church and Zion, it was decided that we would combine households and begin worshiping together in July 2021. Over the next six months, Zion Lutheran and Lakeview Moravian formed a federated congregation, which allows us to act as one congregation while retaining individual denominate, denominational status. As one unified faith community, we are able to reduce both congregations expenses and allow us to provide more ministry in the greater neighborhood. Our combined ministry efforts would be greatly enhanced if we were able to sell our Linden Avenue property to threshold development. Given Threshold's commitment to constructing a passive house property, which strongly supports our values of being good stewards of our earth, we feel this project is worthy of approval. Regardless, we will have to sell the property. It is Zion's desire to leave a legacy that helps with housing needs in Madison and shows a model of good earth care by using passive house certification. 
Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next registrant is Brenda Halverson of Cottage Grove to be followed by Kevin Burrow. Hi, thank you for the time. My name is Brenda Halverson and I'm a member at Common Grace. Our way of being a faith community is different from the past when churches were known for taking over and doing for people. We believe that deep listening and walking with people in the midst of all that is happening in their lives is what we are to do. This is lived out through our community work of sustaining strong existing partnerships and developing new relationships in our neighborhood. By working with groups that have similar intentions, we can help our neighborhood thrive. The funds from the sale of the Linden Avenue property will be used to make improvements to the Tulane Avenue property. These improvements will allow us to create a multi-use community space, but will require a significant cash injection. As Eric mentioned, the Faith family decided to join forces with our Moravian friends to make a greater impact in the community. A few of our current ministries include providing retail, retail, free retail outlet space for Ethical Trade Company, which works to remove women and children from human trafficking and creates jobs, jobs for these individuals. We are also working with Wisconsin Food Forest to plant a pollinator garden this spring. Once this garden is established, we will be plant, planting fruit and nut trees for our neighbors to harvest from. We also are providing space to a bilingual daycare in about in approximately 40% of the property and subsidizing their rent at 50% of market rate. Some of our ministry aspirations for Common Grace could include supplemental child care for low-income families, summer food programs for food insecure families in the greater neighborhood, after school programs for local kids to connect church members to share gifts of time and talents and a senior center for a safe place to gather. We're not going blindly into developing our ministry work. Common Grace pastors are already connecting with community leaders in the neighborhood to identify needs. We've had conversations with Alder Grant Foster, the East Moreland Community Association, the Goodman Center, the principals and social workers at Shank Elementary and Whitehorse Middle Schools, other area churches, and we are participating in Awaken Dane to get a sense of what the needs are in the community. The sale of the property to Threshold Development will allow Common Grace to form to more fully live our mission of being present in a greater segment of the East Side community and of being good stewards of the earth. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Kevin Burrow of Middleton representing Knothi and Bruce Architects to be followed by Timothy McDonald. Good evening, this is Kevin Burrow. And thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, my role tonight is to give you a quick visual of the proposed development that is under consideration tonight. As you can see on the screen in front of you, we are repurposing the Zion Faith Community property, which does serve as a transitional buffer between the Atwood Avenue corridor, which is commercial retail and four-story multifamily to transition into the single-family residential further to the north. If you go to the next slide, please. You can see our proposed layout here. What we are proposing is a two transitioning to a three-story multifamily building, which will have 32 total units and will provide underground parking for 42 vehicles. And the access to this property is off of a shared access drive off of Division Street, I'm sorry, off of Dunning Street, which would then eliminate any traffic into the residential areas to the north by containing all the vehicle traffic to the south on the busier Atwood corridor. Next slide, please. So the, we have numerous perspective renderings, as you can see here. Um, the building immediately to the left is the four-story cornerstone building, which is a multifamily building fronting on Atwood Avenue. We're using the shared access drive between the two. And as you can see here in the scale of the building, we are a two-story structure that does transition up to three-story, but the step backs on all three sides of the building exposed to view is a nine foot step back. You go to the next slide, please. Here's a view then at the corner of Dunning and Linden. As you can see again, the massing of the building is two stories along the street and sidewalk, and you can barely see the third floor recess back. Our main entry is shown here, and our main focus for this development is to engage and be part of the neighborhood by providing direct entry opportunities for each of the apartments. 
Next slide, please. The design of this building is based on a townhome look and feel, which was negotiated through numerous meetings with the neighborhoods and all the appropriate constituents to try and develop a project that is appropriate scale and mass in. Can you go on the next slide, please? Here's another view where you can see the direct entry opportunities for each of the apartments at front along Linden, Division, and Dunning Street. Next slide, please. Here's the back view then looking on Division Street, looking back, again, serving as a transition in height and scale to the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Or that is the last slide, sorry about that. Um, so basically in summary, what we are proposing here is a two transition to three story building that has been designed in collaboration through numerous iterations. This is approximately our fourth design attempt um, in negotiation with the constituents. And we are providing direct entries to each of the apartments. And this has been approved by UDC and we will be making some minor modifications to go back to them in um, accordance to their uh, requests. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Our next registrant is Timothy McDonald of Philadelphia, representing Threshold Development, to be followed by Linda Lenhartz. Do we have Timothy? Yeah, sorry, just got the, the unmute. Would you mind making that full screen view? Um, your your Sorry, clock is this, ticking. This is Heather. I think go ahead. I will do my best here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Thank you for the time here. Um, my name is Tim McDonald. I'm an architect, developer, and builder. And uh, for the past 25 years, we've been focused on building high-performance uh, passive house buildings. Uh, next slide, please. And we've been asked by uh, Threshold Development to uh, join their design team to help develop this certified passive house net zero energy project, which we're very excited by. Next slide. And the reason why is because um, everything that we do every day, we wake up thinking that buildings are responsible for almost half of all greenhouse gas emissions in this country. Next slide. And that combined with the fact that three quarters of all greenhouse gas emissions come from urban environments, there's no way that we can solve the climate crisis unless we solve it with buildings in urban environments. Next slide. Um, we've got less than 20 years to do so. Uh, we've got to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 65% in the, in the next eight years. Um, and so that just means that every building we make needs to be a carbon neutral net zero energy building. Next slide. Um, and that needs to be standard building practice by 2040, in our opinion. Next slide. Um, that means that buildings need to generate what they need on their own site, which means that the roof of the building needs to be large enough to generate what the building energy consumption needs are. Um, that means, next slide, uh, passive house, because passive house is a super insulated, airtight uh, sustainability program for buildings that reduces energy consumption by 80%. When you combine passive house with PV, with solar, that's the only way in our experience that you get to zero energy. Next slide. Um, and we are engaged in multiple projects around the country, renovation, single family, large scale, small scale. Next slide. All focused on passive house net zero energy buildings. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of the first certified passive house project in Pennsylvania that we designed. Next slide. Um, and this is a core principle of passive house, air tightness. This is a measuring of the air tightness of the building. It's 14 times more airtight than a typical code building. Next slide. And this is what that means. The heat stays in rather than heating the streets. It stays in the building. Next slide. Um, and the PV on the roof can therefore generate what the building needs to survive. Next slide. Here's a project of a similar scale. Next slide. Um, That's that time. Okay. 
Thank you. Our next registrant is Linda Lenhertz of District 6 to be followed by Dylan Burrell. Uh, Linda, I see you're on the phone. Star 6 to unmute. Hello. Um, this project is just too big for a low residential area. It compares to 1121 South Park. In my written comments, I compared this project to one that was not approved by Plan Commission in 2019. That one had a mere four units and was essentially the same height as its neighbor and was less than half the length of this project. In that project, the Plan Commission looked to the street that the project was facing and found it incompatible. This project uses a TSS building on Atwood to justify the height, and the project would have a mere seven-foot step down from the Atwood building. Although this project is being reoriented for setback reasons to face the side streets, the main presence will be felt along its 204-foot unarticulated length of Linden. Should all back halves of commercial streets allow for this kind of height? Should all large lots be automatically presumed suitable for this sort of infill? Should all lots where parcels can be combined have this sort of building? The plan commission, the plan, the comprehensive plan recognized the need for more housing and balanced a wide array of, a wide array of interests, including having compatibility with neighboring properties. If a two-story building 93 feet in length is not compatible with low residential, then this project at three stories and 204 feet in length is not compatible. Even though we talk about the step back of the three st third story, it's merely a nine foot step back. And the neighborhood plan amendment is far from the usual standard. Those plan amendments typically specify the land use and this one is, is specifying the development standards. Yet the resolution before you tonight speaks to calling this parcel medium residential. Also being introduced to you tonight is Legistar 71147, a plan to create 13 area plans, which is designed to result in cons consistent plan topics and higher level recommendations. Will this design development standard specified in the amendment survive in the upcoming area plan or will it fall by the wayside? To date, um, new medium residential has not been placed in areas of low residential without there being a significant step back from the low residential. The only step setback here is a narrow local street. The comp plan talks of low medium residential, quote, used as a transition from more intense development to lower intensity uses, lower intensity areas comprised primarily of single family development. This could be a perfect site for missing middle housing, getting 15 units rather than 32. Instead, what is proposed is about the same as many other projects of the 25 to 50 unit size luxury apartments. If these larger lots are not used in and the central time. area for... Thank you. Our next tradition is Dylan Burrell of uh, University Ave to be... Oh, that's our last person listening to speak. Oh, hello. Am I coming through? You are. Hi. Sorry if I sound a bit nervous. This is my first time doing this. Uh, my name is Dylan Brill, and I've been living and renting for Madison in Madison for just over a year. I wanted to speak today to express my support for the Linden Ave development. Uh, since moving here in 2021, I have fallen deeply in love with the city of Madison, and I believe allowing more local builders and contractors to build homes for those of us not able to purchase a single detached home is how people like myself will be able to stay. And I want to stay in Madison for as long as I can. I'd purchase if I could, but it's simply not feasible. Uh, as a personal anecdote, finding a place here that I could reasonably afford was a challenge, and I'm not alone in this. Uh, personally, I make slightly above Madison's median income. And uh, I have coworkers and friends, uh, fellow uh, millennials and Gen Zers, uh, who simply can't find a place to live they can afford. And these are the people who are your baristas, grocery workers, delivery drivers, et cetera. Uh, I would ask the council to consider all the people who would love to live in this neighborhood, but simply can't at the moment. Uh, I think we just need more housing. And um, despite these apartments being market rate, uh, more homes being built leads to a reduction in rents. Um, and this is currently being observed, observed in cities like Minneapolis, where uh, streets.mn um, recently, well, this is an excerpt from an article, uh, Minneapolis leaped from 2,600 
housing unit approvals in 2015 to over 5,000 in 2020. Owners are having to uh, lower asking rents to find renters, diverging from national trends that show spiking rents and is promising for renters. Uh, I'd love the same for Madison. Uh, I really love this city. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. That is all of the registrants wishing to speak on this item. Are there questions for any of our registrants? Alder Carter? You're muted, Alder Carter. Oh, one day. I just have a, a clarification for Mr. Crump, if he's still with us. If not, um, Mr. Barrow, if he's around. Let's get uh, Tyler Krupp and Kevin Burrow back. Yes, I'm Mayor Elder Curry. Yeah, go thank ahead. you. Oh, go, go ahead, Elder. Mayor. Uh, yeah, Mr. Crump, I just want to ask you two things. Um, how many units are there? And also, is there, uh, you said that the Zion Church would have space in this? Um, development, is that space for the church or is that space for um, programming? Sure, I can answer those. Um, there's 32 units in the building. Mm -hmm. um, mix of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms. Um, the total density on the site is about 15, 20% less than where we started. In um, I think there may, may be a misunderstanding on whether the Zion community is staying on site. My understanding is they attempted to do so twice with prior developers and that didn't work out and decided to join congregations with Lakeview Moravian. Um, so they won't have space on site, rather they're creating a new joint space on Tulane Avenue, which they're calling Common Grace. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for clearing that up. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Foster, questions? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Uh, just, uh, I think, one question for uh, Tyler as well. Um, we heard some comments about uh, the desire for affordable housing. Um, could you just give, a, I guess, a high-level um, response to the uh, practicalities or challenges of doing affordable units uh, with this project? Sure, I'm happy to. I mean, first, I want to say I share the desire to do affordable housing. That's part of the reason I came back to learn how to do development. Um, my understanding is um, two attempts were made to do affordable housing on this site. And um, I think there's structural reasons around affordable housing and the details of this site, um, which make it a very challenging site to do affordable housing on. So we, um, Specifically, um, most affordable housing is tax credit light tech deals and most tax credit affordable housing developers won't look at anything that's smaller than say 50, 60 units. And this site certainly wouldn't support that kind of density. Um, so we thought the traditional way of doing affordable housing wasn't possible here. And I think we're all trying to figure out how to do missing middle affordable housing without tax credits. and. Um, we certainly haven't solved that problem and we certainly haven't figured out how to do it quickly under the time constraints that um, the Zion community was working with. I, I guess I would also add, I, I consider market rate of um, rental apartments a contribution to affordable housing. You've heard from numerous people um, that market rate rental housing actually makes this neighborhood accessible. I, I'm someone who couldn't afford to buy in this neighborhood, um, but I can afford to rent. And um, so I, I would kind of reject the notion that market rate affordable housing isn't a contribution to affordable housing. It is, and I hope to figure out how to do better, but um, this site doesn't lend itself to that under these constraints. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Alder, Alder Benford, questions? Thank you, Mayor. I have a question for Tyler or Kevin Burrow. Uh, I believe, Kevin, you had mentioned that there was four revisions. And uh, 
Correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, in the beginning, it, it, it has been a, over a year. It's about this time, I think, Tyler, that you approached me. But it seems like there were more than four revisions. And can you just give me a guesstimate on how many community meetings or how many times you met with, like, the core group and larger groups? Thank you. I'm happy to take that, Kevin. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. Um, my recollection is there were f four to five kind of official revisions, but there were many sort of intermediate attempts at this. Um, we started out with a four story for sale condo project, thinking we were responding to people's desire for home ownership. The feedback we got was that was too big. Um, we considered a townhouse, three-story townhouse model based on the city row apartments on East Johnson, based on the neighborhood's preference for gabled roofs and townhome design. Um, the feedback we got on that was the gabled roofs are too high. Um, we came back with a three-story flat roof building. Um, the feedback we got on that was um, heading in the right direction, but still too dense. And then we um, finally came back with something like the current draft, which is three stories stepping down to two stories. Um, I'm not sure that I could count the number of meetings we had. There was somewhere between five and seven or eight formal meetings, either with the large group or what was later called the small core group. Um, there was at least one meeting with the SASE group probably a half dozen informal meetings with um, subgroups in the neighborhood, countless emails responding to people's concerns and questions. Um, it's my recollection anyway. And I think it does go back to about a year ago that we started this process. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney, questions? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. My question um, also, uh, Kevin, I'm sure that you, is that, no, that's Tyler. I'm sure that uh, you, I'll direct this question to you. Um, there were um, two things I think that you, you mentioned the missing middle. I want to make sure I'm we're on the same page if you can define that. And then my other question is of the one bedroom and of the two bedrooms, what would be the estimated um, um, rent for a one bedroom and a two bedroom? Sure, happy to answer both of these. So I'm sure there's an academic technical definition of missing middle, which is different than my understanding, but my understanding is the missing middle concept points to two things. One, a need for a wider range of housing types that are affordable and accessible to a wider range of people something between large multifamily and single family. Um, I think it also points to a, a scale and density um, that's somewhere between those two things. So missing middle refers to affordability and scale. Um, I think on the scale side, arguably we've, we've arrived at what I would think of as missing middle. I mean, this isn't a project any for-profit developer doing the numbers would propose, it's too small. So we think of this for us as missing middle housing. I realize it's probably a little bigger than some people think of it. Um, in terms of rents, our um, studios will go for about $1,300 a month. Our one bedrooms, somewhere around 16 to 1750. And two bedrooms can go anywhere from 1900 to 21, Any other questions, Alder? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I don't have any other questions. Thank you, Alder. Are there any other questions for any of our registrants? All right, seeing none. Then our next item for public comment is item 24. Uh, which is appealing the plan commission action on the conditional use request for 3734 Speedway Road, which was Legistar 69786. Our first registrant on item 24 is Ruth Allen of East Wash to be followed by Emily Hawk. 
Uh, Ruth, you should see a prompt. Thank you. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. I uh, just want to say thank you uh, for being allowed to speak. Um, and my reason for speaking for the um, development, I was interested in the the um, the commercial space of that building. And I was looking, I know that I know that the residents around the area were concerned about uh, not having like a convenience type store or unit that the stop and go provided. And I was talking with Mr. Cook and I was giving him, you know, I kind of had gave him an idea of what I had to bring in like a neighborhood market for that area that would provide not only uh, convenience items, but fresh food items and lightly cooked items, but they would provide things like dinner for if if people needed dinner. And I'm a little nervous because this is my first time talking in front of people, but I just wanted to fill a niche that I fit, that I see that the uh, neighborhood is looking to have feel, which is that convenience component of the store. So like milk, juice, eggs, uh, fresh food items, as well as prepared food items, I would like to bring into that un- into that uh, development there. And I know I have two minutes, but that's all I have to say right now. Thank you. All right, next registrant is Emily Hauk of District 5 to be followed by Kevin Burrow. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, I am uh, speaking in support of the appeal that was filed in opposition to the Planning Commission's approval. Um, I agree with the current city administration's focus and goal of increasing housing in the city. However, I think it's really critical that the mission of increased housing not result in a rubber stamping approval of all projects. Um, I believe that the Planning Commission did an inadequate job in addressing all the necessary related standards and the staff report contained inaccuracies and that was largely what their vote was based on. Um, According to the approval standards, no application for conditional use should be granted unless it finds that all 17 conditions are met. Um, And um, there are numerous ways that they did not Uh, meet that requirement. Um, An excess height is compatible with the existing or planned character of the surrounding area, but is not limited to scale and mass. This is a proposed four-story apartment building in a neighborhood of largely one-story ranch homes um, that until initially, until recently, had a uh, a convenience store that people could walk to. Um, In order for excess height to be allowed, Um, It's supposed to allow for a demonstrable higher quality building than could be achieved without additional stories. Um, At one point, the developer indicated that the project for the project to be financially viable for himself, he needs it to be four stories. Why is the neighborhood having to pay the price for the developer having made a poor business decision by purchasing a property too small to accommodate um, a three story building on an adequate size lot? The staff report stated that the developer's uh, proposal satisfied the side yard height transition to residential homes. Um, This was incorrect. In fact, the property owner on the northeast corner um, is their ranch um, one story home is going to be six feet from a four story building. Um, Standard five talks about the need for adequate drainage. Uh, The report never addressed management of drainage during and post-construction and the grading between the proposed four-story building and the adjoining residential backyards is particularly critical given that resident uh, residual groundwater and soil contamination has been found on the property. Uh, That was not addressed in the report that I could see. Um, One of the reasons they gave for only having 24 parking stalls for 31 apartments was that it's on a bus line, um, but now with the proposed changes in bus transit, there's only gonna be service during rush hour. Um, Standard number three, the uses, values, and enjoyment of other property in the neighborhood 
for purposes already established will not be substantially impaired or diminished. Um, this and that's one, time. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you. Our next registrant is Kevin Burrow of Middleton, representing Knothi and Bruce, to be followed by Alex Saludos. Good evening. Thank you again for your time this evening. What I want to do is give you a visual of this development as well. As you can see on the screen in front of you, located and it touches both Glenway Street and Speedway Road. And the uniqueness about this site is the fact that Speedway Road is, in essence, a full story lower in elevation than Glenway Street. So the proposed project, albeit a three transitioning to four story building on Speedway, is actually only a two transitioning to three story building on Glenway. Go to the next slide, please. Here's the overall layout then. And you can see how the massing of this building is shown in this um, aerial view here. It does step back in three different locations on three sides. And our step backs vary um, as required by the zoning code to meet the step setback requirements. So we have a six foot initial step back along the northern side, and then it actually transitions to another 11 feet step back for the uppermost story. Along Speedway Road, we are choosing to step the building back 12 feet in order to reduce the mass and character and feel of the building along the street. And then along Glenway, we are doing a 10 foot step back as well as transition to that residential area. Can you go to the next slide, please? Here are the overall floor plans where you can see we are providing 24 stalls on the lower level, which is in essence an exposed basement level along Speedway, but a full buried basement along Glenway. And then the upper floors are a mix of housing units. And then the fourth floor does have the transition step backs. If you go to the next slides. We put together numerous renderings to just show this building in true scale and character with the surrounding buildings at their appropriate scale and character based on the terrain of the site. And with this view, you can see how even the neighboring building next to us does rise up in height as Glenway Street behind is a full story higher. But on this view, you can see the three-story facade with the, in essence, the exposed basement and the main entry. And then that fourth floor has been recessed back to be um, out of view. If you go to the next slide, please. Here's a front on view then basically all the way across Speedway Road, you can just get a glimpse of that uppermost story. Next slide, please. Here's a perspective view. And actually we've elevated a camera angle just to be clear about how that fourth floor um, reacts here, but we are much elevated in order to show this perspective view. Next slide, please. And then here's a view on the back side of the building along Glenway Street, where you can truly see the scale of the building is appropriate to the neighboring property. And then the step back for that upper story has been recessed back in order to minimize the character and feel of it along the sidewalk and street. Go to the next slide. I'm sorry, thank you very much. And then another view looking back towards the building along Glenway Street with the golf course in the background. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next registrant is Alex Saludos of District 5 to be followed by Carol Richard. Uh, Alex, you should see a prompt. Sorry, I accidentally muted you. Uh, you can go. you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I don't have a lot to say. Uh, what can I say in three minutes on a complex subject that's going to be heard, understood, and meaningful? Uh, approval of CUPs by state law are to be a thoughtful quasi-judicial decision based on the facts and the evidence and the relevant standards, not a political decision based on the will of the commission or the council, the need for housing, the developer's costs, the site conditions, or legal restrictions on the property. Uh, state statute requires the applicant must demonstrate the application and all requirements and conditions established by the city relating to the conditional use are or shall be satisfied, both of which must be supported by substantial evidence. In addition, state law requires that the city's decision to approve or deny the permit must be supported by substantial evidence. Substantial evidence is defined in state law as facts and information other than merely personal preferences or speculation directly pertaining to the requirements and conditions an application must meet to obtain a conditional use permit and that reasonable persons would accept in support of a conclusion. The applicant or city staff telling you what they think isn't enough. 
There are several major elements of the design that are significantly out of conformance with the applicable goals and standards. It raises so many questions relative to the goals and standards in the code, comp plan, and neighborhood plan. How can how could the plan commission or you make an informed decision without referring this to the UDC? It sets a precedent. This project sets a precedent for redevelopment to seven other commercial properties nearby that are ripe for redevelopment. Can you imagine what this area will look like if these other properties are developed in a similar fashion? When it is approved, it will be hard to say no to others. Good Lord, this is such perverse urban planning. This streetscape is going to be brutal. It's going to suck the vitality out of this area. For example, there are seven other commercial buildings in this node. Five are one story. Two are two story. The total square footage of all of these buildings is 24,500 square feet. The proposed building alone, that single building, is over twice the size of all the other commercial buildings in that node. The scale and character of the proposed building re relative to the surrounding buildings, I don't see the substantial <laughs> evidence that it complies with the standards uh, r relative to this. Um, I'm not optimistic you're going to uh, support the uh, uh, this appeal, and it's probably better to kick the can down the road and let a judge who's going to be more objective and take the time to look at the facts. And, and that's, that's time. Yeah. Thank you. Our next registrant is Carol Richard of District 5 to be followed by Tiffany. Hi, uh, my name is Carol Richard, and I live in the neighborhood on Ross Street. I'm not at all opposed to development. I'm an architect. I've spent my career designing public projects. I like seeing good development happen. And I believe that most everyone in the neighborhood would like to see a nice development over an abandoned gas station. I am, however, opposed to this project for several reasons. First off, the project has been submitted as a mixed-use project within the neighborhood mixed-use district. Both the zoning ordinance and the comprehensive plan state that this district is established to encourage and sustain the viability of commercial nodes that serve the shopping needs of residents in adjacent neighborhoods. This proposal has one small commercial space, about 600 feet, located in the southeast corner of the building. It's such a small space, it doesn't provide service to the neighborhood. It was clearly incorporated into the plans in order to get special dispensation for an increase in density under the supplemental regulations. The authors of the zoning ordinance and the comprehensive plan for the city of Madison went to great lengths to set standards for how mixed use developments should meet the street. There are multiple diagrams in the ordinance describing the goal, including a mandate that 60% of the length of the building along Speedway should be windows and or doors. The goal is to enliven activity at the street level and to encourage pedestrian activity. Take a look at the Speedway elevation. Starting from the southwest corner, there is one window for the single single commercial space. This is followed by a faux window, a small lobby for residents, and then a large roll-up door and a trash room. I suppose if you count the roll-up doors and opening, it might come close to meeting the 60% requirement. But is that really what the authors of the ordinance had in mind? And is it good for our city? I believe it sets a low bar for future development in our neighborhood and throughout the city. Secondly, the development is out of scale for the neighborhood. The Hoyt Park neighborhood plan specifically addresses this parcel of land. The guidelines state that any development should maintain single family scale along adjoining streets and property edges. Contrary to the city planning staff report, it also states that the height of any development should be limited to two stories along the north property line. This proposal doubles that height and the building is located six feet from the north property line abutting single story homes. This will significantly diminish the value of the adjacent property owners and will adversely affect their quality of life. This is just not fair to them. There are also safety issues that have been ignored. For instance, city engineering guidelines call for a 10 foot vision triangle for vehicles entering, exiting onto roadways for safe exiting. This proposal calls for a reduction to 5.5 feet and this is onto Speedway Road. There's a reason it's called Speedway. I think the developer needs to go back to the drawing board and come back with a proposal that meets both the requirements and the intent of the zoning ordinance. 
the comprehensive plan, and, that's and the neighborhood plan. Thank you. Our next registrant is Tiffany of District 5 to be followed by Frederick Berg. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to speak this evening. This is actually my second council meeting um, in the past two years. Um, so I just want to point out to the alders who are uh, in attendance that this uh, meeting when it went to proposal, 100% of the neighborhood was opposed to this neighborhood uh, proposal, not because we're opposed to development of the area, but we want affordable housing. The developer was never able to give us uh, a price on what he intended to charge the units, charge people for the units um, on a single income as a small business owner. I feel that that's an important fact that's being missed here. If I go to the bank and ask for a loan for my business, I need to dispel the uh, facts of what I intend on charging for my product. And um, the developer has failed to tell us what the cost of these units will be. Uh, my 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 other three red flags are pretty obvious. There's insufficient parking for the tenants and the commercial here. Um, the developer also in, in one of the meetings said that if the commercial wanted to expand, he would eliminate more of the parking garage space for the commercial. Um, 24 spots for 31 units isn't even enough uh, parking for the tenants, let alone guests. Um, and there's currently no walkability on this co uh, corner. Um, my other co concern with this is this, this was a prior gas station, which has environmental concerns. It's my understanding they're putting the, gar the garage on top of the land instead of actually cleaning up the environment uh, that was caused by the prior gas station. Um, my understanding is that's not to zoning and code. Um, my other my other concern regarding safety, Carol hit on, is that the uh, parking garage setback is not uh, to code or zoning, um, and it's also a blind. Uh, if people are trying to turn left out of this garage, um, there is a bend in the road, so it will be a blind left hand turn. You can't see the oncoming traffic, um, and and I just think it's going to be problematic. The setback's insufficient. The exit to the garage is insufficient. Um, uh, it just doesn't seem safe. Uh, there's going to be an elimination of the bus route there. People are going to need cars. They're they're not going to be able to rely on the bus to get to the grocery store because uh, of the limited uh, routes. Um, and, and, you know, like in closing, I just think we have these zoning and coding guidelines and laws for a reason, and, and we need to respect those. And I, I feel that the developer needs to go back to the drawing board. The neighborhood is in favor of developing this plan, and we're all happy to give input. Um, and I just think that if we work together as a team, we'll be much more successful in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Frederick Berg of District 5 to be followed by Brandon Cook. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. My name is Fred Berg, and I live in the neighborhood on Ross Street. And tonight before dinner, I walked over to the building site through a neighborhood of modest, small, single-family homes. The house closest to the proposed site is a single story home that's set back from the property line by six foot. That's kind of their side yard setback. I imagined a four story building right next to that house, not a pretty site. The architect showed an, a bunch of views of the building. None of the views were from the side of the neighborhood. They were all hiding the neighborhood behind a huge structure. Yeah, and the six foot side yard setback is opposite the front of the building. I guess that's probably not the intent of the zoning codes either, but they needed that to make the project work. Uh, and one of the earlier projects that was discussed tonight, uh, the architect talked about re transitioning to the neighborhood in terms of height and scale. I certainly don't see that here. And then there certainly is a big wink to the mixed use in the plan. It's nice that Ruth Allen wants to start a small business in that space. There's two two parking spaces. One is handicapped and one is a normal parking space. Uh, it's on the side of the building. I don't, it's really hard for me to believe you could have a viable uh, retail grocery business in that space, but they needed to, have this wink at mixed use in order to make the project work. Lastly, on the issue of parking, there are 31 units. We've heard it before and 24 parking spaces. Earlier, 
a project was discussed, there were 32 units and 42 parking spaces. There is no on-street parking on Speedway. 90% of low-income families in the U.S. have a car. Even many families living at the poverty level have a car. It's delusional to think that parking is not going to cause a significant neighborhood problem. Conditional recruit. Conditional use requires some evidence that the condition is workable, not just a hope and a claim that people will take a bus someplace and not have a car. I ask you not to support this project in its current form. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Our next registrant is Brandon Cook of District 6. Hi, my name is uh, Brandon Cook. I am the developer, builder, and the owner. Um, you know, this is a great neighborhood. Um, when Quick Trip reached out to me uh, to buy this property, um, I thought, wow, you know, what a great place for housing. I mean, uh, a gas station that wasn't economically viable um, and a big enough lot that could fit uh, a modest amount of housing. I mean, there's been some talk about the size, but in all reality, this is a pretty small project compared to the other things um, that come before you. But I've listened to the neighborhood. Um, one of their big issues was the convenience store. Um, Ruth actually reached out to me and she told me about her neighborhood market. And I said, fantastic, problem solved. But there's still some skeptics out there that uh, Ruth can't... Uh, you know, viably do a market, but I, I think that's up to Ruth. And it's it's my job as the developer to create spaces um, uh, for people to enjoy. And so although a, a small commercial space, I've found somebody that wants to put a market there, satisfying the need, uh, not to mention the stop and go that was open at this location definitely wasn't the, the largest uh, stop and go in all of Wisconsin. Um, but, you know, after the plan commission unanimously, uh, unanimously approved this project, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that you will agree and, uh, appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Those are our registrants, uh, wishing to speak. Are there questions for any of our registrants on this item? Other boss questions? Yeah, a question for the owner or for the Kevin, Kevin Burrow, one of them. Uh, all right, can we have uh, Kevin Burrow back and Brandon Cook, please? Thank you. A uh, quick question is about the gas station and the contamination and removal. Could you please provide some information? What steps you guys are taking? Sure. I'm like the last stop and go. Um, site that I bought, um, we had a phase two done. Um, ultimately, we don't know until we start digging, but um, there probably is something in there and we need to uh, remedi remediate it appropriately. Um, more than likely, it involves hauling the uh, removed soils to a specific dump site to, um, you know, get rid of them in an appropriate way. We should clarify that the phase two was done and did not show any initial contaminants such that, um, as Brandon mentioned, we may discover some through excavation, but it is considered a um, buildable site at this time. Sure. See, that's right, Kevin. All right, Kevin, quick question uh, about that uh, 600 square feet uh, storefront. What was the rationale keeping 600 square feet, not more? It's actually over 800 square feet. It's about 810 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, we are walking a fine line here with regards to the amount of parking that we feel would be appropriate to the building while still providing the commercial space. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, this is in essence, the lowest level of the building being exposed, which would normally be underground and would allow for additional parking below the commercial space as opposed to the commercial space needing to occupy parking space as well. So it was a balance, um, but we felt that at 800 square feet, it certainly would be leasable and would be a benefit to the community as opposed to a larger commercial space that you often see in these mixed use developments that sits vacant for a number of years due to the um, 
excessive size and or um, no true need for the area. Okay, and it's a. Did you guys also have a plan for expansion? It's a pity the next door uh, hair salon. I think so. If the whole parcel you can get, the project could be much better. Did you guys check with them? Um, I'll take that one. Um, I talked to the yarn barn. I believe it's called on the corner. Mm -hmm. um, they were going to reach out to the salon in between. Um, ultimately from what I've heard, um, the owner is selling it to, um, one of the people that work in the salon. And so, um, ultimately, uh, never heard back, um, but definitely reached out to see if there was, uh, any interest. Okay. Um, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Other, other Carter questions. Just, just a clarification either. Kevin or Brandon, can you pull up the slide that you showed um, of the commercial space, number one? Number two, when you um, said that you might find something after you uh, uh, disrupt the, the ground, is parking going to be on the surface or is it going to be underground? So... The parking layout is such that when you drive in off a of speedway, you do not uh, need to go underground at all. You're basically driving in at grade, but we will be excavating towards the back, towards Glenway Street. So the rear half of the property will be excavated to a depth of approximately 10 feet. So um, we are not sure as that rear portion is excavated. Um, granted that the um, fuel pumps were up front, and we, intend, mm. we do not intend to excavate below that level. So it is our goal that simply by um, putting in our frost walls and capping it with a concrete floor slab that we would contain anything within that area. And is the commercial space visible from, from Speedway? Yes, it is. It's right on the uh, northeast corner of the building. So it has um, the exposure for that corner, which is adjacent to the exterior parking stalls, those two stalls that were mentioned earlier. And there's glass uh, windows on both the front and the side for um, the best exposure we could provide. Okay. And how many units are in this building? There's a total of 31 units. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions for any of our registrants? Seeing none, we will go on to item 33, which is the appointments to the Common Council Executive Committee for the 2022-23 session. Our first registrant is Mara Aish of District 10 to be followed by Bonnie. Um, Mayor, I do not see Mara in the list. Do we have Bonnie from District 11? Ronnie Rowe. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Common Council. Thank you for the opportunity to say something on this item. I can't say I'm surprised by President Furman's selections for the Common Council Executive Committee. Other council presidents, most recently President Carter and President Abbas, made the decision to round out the committee with a variety of perspectives and ideologies to bring balance around the table. When making decisions for the city, it's nice to have a blend of viewpoints and the advantage of seeing things from different angles. But regardless, it is the president's choice. He chose to select council members that see things like he does, that vote like he does, that will not push back on his priorities or stand in the way of them passing. That is his right. But what threw me for a loop was the process. To conduct interviews of his colleagues, should Alder Carter and Alder Miazzi really have to explain to President Furman what measures you have taken to further your knowledge of racial justice, equity, and inclusion? They're living it. Two alders here tonight resigned from a previous committee chaired by Alder Furman because they both, Black women, did not feel their voices were heard. The chair was not inclusive and their perspectives not valid time and time again. It does not ring true to me that President Furman values inclusivity, equity, and diversity. 
at least not diversity of thought or inclusivity of voices that are not in sync with his own. He has selected an executive committee made up of one perspective who will vote as one block. They always do. Let's see if it works in the best interests of the city. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Those are our, that's our registrant on this item. Are there any questions? Seeing none, our next item is item 71, approving plans and specifications for the Walnut Grove single track trail improvement. Our registrant is George Meyer of District 9. Mayor, there's no one by that name in the list. Okay, then item 77, approving a land sale. Oh, Alder Conklin? So is now still not my time yet? No, not yet. We're still okay. in public comment, Alder. Oh, okay, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Yep. On item 77, approving a land sale and agreements with Dane County regarding the Yahara Hills Golf Course. Uh, first registrant is Mike Fall of District 16 to be followed by Catherine Levin. Hi, are you able to hear me okay? Yes. Hi, my name is, my name is Mike Fall, and I'm with Neighbors for a Better Landfill Coalition. Tonight, we aren't asking you to vote no on the landfill sale. We're actually just simply asking you to, to postpone the vote because there are too many unknowns. There hasn't been enough input or outreach into the community, and most neighbors just found out about this plan a few weeks ago. I understand that while technically the city and county may have followed the rules of government by listing the issue on committee schedules and the like, the reality is that doesn't mean actual community engagement has occurred. But now that neighbors and community members are informed, they're getting engaged. As you may have seen, there was a letter of signers from the following individuals and groups that went around post asking for postponing of tonight's vote. The McFarland School Board members, McFarland School Business Manager, Cottage Grove Board member, several McFarland Village Trustees, AFT Local 3497, and several neighborhood associations as well, all asking this committee table the vote for today and allow for more input and have issues addressed. There are still too many unknowns and not enough communication with the local community on this. The McFarland School District, which has land 2,000 feet away from this proposed landfill, was just briefed on this plan for the first time about an hour before this current meeting started. You are putting a landfill next to a school land and never talked to the school district about it. The AFT local has signed on to a letter asking for a pause. Many teachers live in the impacted neighborhoods and many more teachers would teach at this school, but what would the health impact be on teachers and students? No one knows. AFT just found out about this issue about on Friday. The more neighbors, community leaders, and local electeds learn about this issue, the more questions arise. In fact, County Board Chair Patrick Miles just announced last night at the County Committee hearing he's likely to vote against this landfill proposal. The landfill will be next to hundreds of homes and impact thousands. Usually new landfills are placed in more rural areas, so impact and compensation need only go to dozens of houses rather than the impact of thousands we're talking here. Look, it may be true that this may be the only place a landfill can be sited in the entire county, but my neighbors and community leaders and I aren't sold on that idea yet because we don't feel enough due diligence has been done to conclude that. This is a 40 year plus commitment. Isn't it worth pausing the vote and ensuring we get this right? In short, in short, there's no reason to vote on this issue tonight until real community engagement can happen. Again, Village of McFarland trustees are asking, McFarland school board members, Blooming Grove teachers union, and now county board chair Patrick Miles has expressed concern for whatever reason, even if technically uh, the plan was posted according to government notice rules, the reality is people impacted weren't informed for whatever reason. I'm not here to point fingers on that, just state it as the reality. The political legwork has not yet been done on this issue and it isn't ready for prime time. So please send it back to the committee and postpone today's vote so that legwork can be done. Thank you. Our next registrant is Catherine Levin of District 16 to be followed by Jennifer Munns. Hi, council members. I won't repeat anything Mike has said, and I'm sure lots of my uh, neighbors are also here who would like to speak out against the sale of the Yohara Golf Course um, to Dane County, so I'm going to be quick. Um, I guess I just feel like a Madison that tears down public parks to build landfills, landfills near residential areas just isn't the Madison that I know. 
Um, our neighborhood isn't that old and it kind of feels like this was a bit of a bait and switch move in next to a golf course. Oh wait, now it's a landfill. Um, it's just really disheartening because I never expected that the city of Madison would be selling parkland, um, and wouldn't be used towards more parkland. You know, it's, it feels very unlike Madison. And that's the reason why I live here. Cause I, I love the mindset. Um, also, the intersection of the Beltline and the interstate is the main way into our city. Uh, there used to be a golf course that greeted visitors. And now the welcome mat we're going to lay out is, welcome to Madison. Just drive through this valley of garbage first. It seems, again, very uncharacteristic of the Madison that I know. Um, the people of Secret Places were Madisonians. Yeah, we're not your next door neighbors, but that doesn't seem fair to make us next door neighbors with the dump and the trash that you're going to throw away for the next few decades. Please just please don't sell this land. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Jennifer Munns of District 16 to be followed by Catherine Cox. Hi there. Thank you for the opportunity. As a Secret Places neighborhood family of four, and part of the Neighbors for a Better Land Fill Coalition. We support all that Mike Full has said, and we are also pleased to hear Patrick Miles, County Board Chair, state in the County Board Personnel and Finance Committee meeting yesterday, that he is leaning towards opposing the authorizing the purchase of uh, Yahara Hills land for county landfill. We hope he continues to express his concerns to his colleagues. To you all, on behalf of my family, I ask you to please vote no, or at minimum delay the vote on the sale until the local communities have had sufficient time to assess the impact of this unprecedented landfill and composting site design on quality of life, health, and property values for 600 plus families. In terms of quality of life, we built our dream house in secret places in 2011, and we were looking forward to Rotafield closing in 2015, and we know that it's been extended to 2030. We were really looking for getting some relief from what started in 2017. While we understand Mr. Welch and his team are doing their best, it is an understatement to say that our communities are dissatisfied with the odor mitigation at Rotefeld. It impacts our quality of life three seasons of the year. This new landfill will be managed by the same individuals using the same insufficient odor mitigation systems. While we understand that Mr. Welch's team is growing and he says they have more things to try in order to mitigate odor, and I hope with all my heart it works. My question for you are, my questions are, if what if it doesn't work? As a community, we all will just be stuck with the smell of rotten eggs and decomposing garbage swirling around our neighborhoods during our prime months to get outside and enjoy the fresh air. Can you imagine what it's like to open your windows to ventilate your home on a nice day and then have to close them again because you don't want the inside of your home to smell gross? And not just a couple of times a year for manure spreading, but often over the course of three seasons. To make matters worse in this particular sale, the proposal includes a composting operation. And Mr. Welch has publicly admitted that they are not sure how they will manage odors for the composting operation, except I quote, we have to keep it aerobic. According to BioCycle, a go-to resource on composting, organics, recycling, et cetera, I quote, even under optimum conditions for aerobic decomposition of organic matter, odors are going to form. It may not be a rotten egg smell, but it's still very, very unpleasant. Anyone who has been around compost knows what I mean here. My question to you is, is the city and county trying to tell the 600 plus families that you are willing to gamble with the quality of life over the, the next, next 40 plus years? Thank you. Our next registrant, sorry, I lost my place, is Catherine Cox of District 16 to be followed by Irina uh, Spiegelman. <laughs> Pretend it's two S's. Catherine Koss. Catherine Koss, sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I know that you're looking at, uh, at, at adding into the uh, plan uh, 
trees and a 10 foot berm and a variety of other things to help to block the uh, the landfill from the road as people are coming into Madison. However, already uh, there are times when I can be driving down the highway and there are papers and other trash floating through the air or swirling in the wind. If they can't keep trash in the landfill as it is, how are we going to keep trash in the new landfill? That's a question that I haven't seen answered yet. I know I know it's not necessarily coming from the landfill itself, but it's coming from the vehicles going to the landfill. And that's a major problem. It's still something that people are seeing as they're coming into the city. And it's also carrying with it odors and particulates. And it's those particulates that I'm especially concerned about because it's those particulates, those tiny microns of, of, of matter that are small enough to get into the lungs and from the lungs into the bloodstream and from there into the organs and the brains of, of people, especially damaging those of children and of the elderly. I'm concerned about that. A school is going to be built 2,000 feet away from that landfill. Are you willing to gamble with the lives and the health of those children? I don't think that that is the place to be putting the sustainability campus. I think the sustainability campus is a great idea. However, I'm not sure that it's been gone about the right way. I think that there are a large number of things that could be done to change and enhance it, but to place it outside of the city further. I think allowing this area of the city the opportunity to grow and to build other businesses is one way of providing for a larger tax base, for one thing. And tonight, I've heard over and over and over again discussions about how badly Madison needs affordable housing. If you're going to sell land, uh, golf course property, why not put some affordable housing there? Some housing that will help those middle of the road families. I think that when you look at programming and the ways that we can build our city, moving the landfill with its sustainability campus much further outside of the city, and it might not be a contiguous uh, 200 acres, but could give us an opportunity to do some truly remarkable things. And that's but time. at the same time, save our house. Thank you. Our next registrant is Irina Spiegelman of McFarland to be followed by Daniel Parks. Um, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, hello. Good evening. Thank you for um, the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Irina. I am a resident in McFarland. Uh, I live in the Juniper Ridge uh, neighborhood. Uh, we just moved and built our um, home in May of um, 2020. Um, and this landfill exp expansion kind of came as a shock. Um, from talking to people, most of them were not aware. A lot of our neighbors were not aware how close this landfill will be to our neighborhood. Um, we're definitely going to be affected with that. Um, another news that we just found out that there's going to be a school there and uh, it's quite possible. We have three kids that are school age that our kids will be going to school next to the landfill. Uh, we're not excited about that. This is not an issue of not doing that in my backyard. I wouldn't wish it upon anybody's backyard. I think that landfills should not be put, put in close proximity to such high density residential neighborhoods. Actually, I don't know of any other county, state, um, um, county or state uh, that would do that in the in the country where the landfill, such a huge landfill with a composting site would be uh, purposefully put so close to the housing. Um, the sustainability campus sounds great, but if that's not possible, then we'll let's split it. Let's have the recycling facility where we want to have it and move the landfill with a compost further away. Um, so, yeah, I just want to, again, say that we're all very concerned. There are a lot of concerned neighbors that are reaching out to the officials and um, asking for this decision to be reconsidered. Um, thank you for your time. 
Thank you. Our next registrant is Daniel Parks of McFarland to be followed by Shannon Morrison. Hi, this is uh, Dan Parks. Thanks. Um, I really don't have any uh, canned speech or anything, <laughs> uh, but I, I do have some concerns. I, I, I think that would be interesting to the group. Um, everyone voting on this, I, I actually encourage you to do a quick search. Um, health effects on children living near landfills. Um, I'd like you to really look at that. Um, I actually, since I'm not getting my answers by John Welsh, um, not being answered, um, I wanted to ask the question, you know, to someone who has more insight. So I called the DNR and I talked to the DNR and they're, they're actually doing, you know, they didn't even know about it. First off, they were actually surprised that I was asking the question as to, how many high capacity landfills are being placed next to within 2000 feet of an elementary school. And this individual didn't have the answer, um, but seemed very surprised. Um, this individual didn't know that the school was going to be there. This individual didn't know about the 2017 air quality issues. So I was obliged to uh, give that person, that information. So I also called region five, uh, EPA still waiting to hear back from that. Um, and one of the reasons that the DNR does not know this information is, is that the landfill has not submitted their air pollution control permit. Um, and I know what they're going to response is going to be. They're going to say, well, give us the property and then we'll get the permits. That seems kind of backwards to me. Let us purchase the property, then we'll go through all the permitting, and then we'll let you know. Okay, that, that, is, that is completely backwards. That's like buying a house before you know it has asbestos in it. Okay, J just a little insight. I, I have, I've been a safety professional for 20 years, and the DNR is supposed to be a neutral party. So what is the delay going to be? when you approve the sale of a property without knowing, and then they kick it back saying, well, this isn't acceptable. It's unacceptable to me that there is no plan B. They've been planning this for two years, two years. And then they say, well, oh, we just told them six months ago. Well, that's great. I, I just talked to neighbors like two weeks ago. They didn't know about it. They're rushing this through because they know what is coming. They're rushing this through because they know we know all the issues. Um, so I'm going to just leave it at this. Um, I just want everyone to know May is a Clean Air Act, or Air Month. Uh, Wisconsin DNR just sent me that, by the way. <laughs> I just uh, find it interesting that we're voting on the passing of a land landfill with a bunch of uh, air quality issues when you're placing it 2,000 feet from a school. And that's time. Thank you. Our next registrant is Shannon Morrison of McFarland. Madam Mayor, are you able to hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the Common Council, thank you so much for hearing us out on this issue. I am a resident of McFarland, but I'm not just speaking today on behalf of myself and my family. I'm also speaking on behalf of my elderly mother and stepfather. Um, my mom, please Google this. Um, she has interstitial lung disease. And my stepdad is a bypass recipient. They are in District 3, and we live in District 16. What that means is that my mom lives six minutes north of the uh, current landfill, and I live six minutes south of the current landfill. Um, please my greatest recommendation and request is that you either table this and request that more information be provided to the residents in this area or that you'd simply vote no. And I realize that voting no is not something that is commonly done. So if we can just vote to delay this and get more information to the residents, that is where this needs to start. Um, the people working at the landfill might say, you know, we've done so much to try to inform people, but um, that's been done over the year, past year and a half. And I will admit, I did hear about this in the very beginning. However, I would like to add, um, in case anybody was missing out on the past couple of years, there was this thing called COVID. And um, I'm a healthcare worker, so I've been a little bit busy. Um, and now this very big impact that could affect the health of my family that is elderly, as well as my children, has come to my attention. 
I am concerned about my mom's lung disease. I'm concerned about the impact on my stepdad. And I'm also concerned about the lung development of my children. One person said, what articles are being done and what research has been being done? If you're able, please look this up as well. The New England Journal of Medicine in September of 2004 put out an article titled, The Effects of Air Pollution on Lung Development from Age 10 to 18 Years of Age. Um, one of the things that this talks about is it talks about exposures to ozone, acid vapors, nitrogen dioxide, and particulate matter. Um, and it discusses how this changes how children's lungs are able to process oxygen and how lung capacity is actually decreasing from generation to generation due to standard air particulate matter. And landfills are a source of that particulate matter. Um, one interesting item that I would also like to point out is that in the application to expand vertically, quote, the application states for this landfill, the current Rotafeld landfill, potential impacts that cannot be avoided would include the following, truck traffic, dust, engine emissions, and noise associated with the landfill, odors that may occur periodically, and changes in appearance and top, uh, topography of the site. After the landfill is closed, there would be limitations of use to this property. One might argue, well, why did you live so close to a landfill to begin with? I have known about the existence of the Rotefeld landfill going back to 1997 when I started college at UW-Madison. I was aware of that landfill. And because of that, I chose to build in McFarland and chose to be part of that. And community. that's time. Thank you. Those are all of our registrants wishing to speak. We have a number of folks registered as available to answer questions. I believe you all have the list. Uh, are there questions for any of our registrants on this item? Alder Vitiver? I apologize. Um, do we have somebody from the county in the list of folks who are available for questions? Uh, yes. We have John Welch uh, from uh, representing Dane County. Can we Fantastic. get John Welch up for the Alder, please? I believe I'm unmuted, correct? Yes, you are. Go Can ahead, Alder. Could you just um, give a very, very brief um, overview of um, both the outreach that has been done to date and the outreach that would still remain need to be done um, should this sale go forward? Yes, thank you, Alder. Um, we have done an extensive amount of outreach to date. We did publicly announce this with a press release uh, back a little over six months ago. Since then, that time, there's also been an additional press release. There have been... Uh, 11 now public committees between city committees and county committees which have taken this item up where it has been passed unanimously at each committee. Uh, in addition though, in terms of actual outreach into the community, we've held uh, three listening sessions, information and listening sessions in the neighborhood uh, back I believe in November, or excuse me, in December and then in March and then in April. Um, and with that last one, we actually sent out over 550 postcard mailers to all the households in the area. Uh, we've also held two tours uh, at our existing landfill to uh, educate the, the neighbors about the, the efforts that we're doing already. Uh, again, those are tours for the, the neighbors in that case. Um, and so we've, uh, with those three uh, public meetings and the information sessions, uh, after our information, we stayed and answered questions in front of the group until they didn't have any more questions. Um, and that was over seven and a half hours total of meeting with the community. Um, we have also created a website for this project where we've posted all the pertinent information, um, all the recordings from the previous meeting, frequently asked questions and other information. So again, I think we've, we've um, really gone kind of above and beyond what's typical in order to make sure that we reach out to the, the community on this project. Uh, to your, your second half of the question, this doesn't mean with tonight's vote, if it were successful, that that's the end of our outreach with the community. It's, it's really just the beginning. This is for the sale of the land, which allows us to proceed with the permitting and other steps. But there's many uh, additional steps in the permitting process, the local negotiated agreement process, which actually require us to have public comment periods. In addition to that, we, we fully intend to continue to engage with the community um, address their concerns throughout the, the design and the operation of this facility. And then just following up on that, um, some of the speakers talked about their concerns around odors, air quality, trucks, dust, et cetera. Can you just speak um, very briefly about how you'll be addressing that? 
absolutely. So some of the items such as dust, uh, well, dust, first of all, is, is specifically in our air permit, um, and we do comply with that currently. But some items such as dust and, and uh, truck routes and traffic, those are addressed through the local negotiated agreement process. So that's actually spelled out in state statute, that process. So um, that would likely occur starting in the first quarter of next year, where we would actually be negotiating with the communities uh, nearest us about those types of uh, factors for the site. Um, in terms of odors, uh, you know, we have learned through these listing sessions that we do have additional work to do with regard to odors. And so we are already making improvements. We've installed additional gas wells in the last several months for gas collection at our site. We're extending a uh, odor controlled vapor based system around the south side of the site. That work is actually happening right now with our own staff. We um, are uh, proposing to add a full-time position, which will be someone whose full-time job is specifically to address odors and the, the gas collection system at our site. Uh, but we also see a lot of opportunity at this new site with the additional space to look at um, waste that may be causing odors specifically and how we maybe segregate or manage those waste differently at this site with the, the additional space that we think will really help. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter, questions? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Welch, I have a question regarding your outreach. So your third meeting, you said you sent out 6,000 postcards. On um, the first and second meeting, how were those announced? Yeah, on, on the first and second meetings, the first one was uh, hosted by the Dane County Public Works. So there was a press release that went out in advance of that. Um, and with the second one, that one was a request um, from the village of McFarland. And so we worked through uh, the local officials there to try to get the word out as well. Um, in addition to that, we had started to have contacts with people who were interested in uh, this project or had asked questions about it. And so we had created an uh, email list and we um, sent out an email to those folks as well. I don't have the full number, but it's well over a hundred people on that list as well. Okay, and then one of and then, the targets. Sorry, oh, go one, ahead. sorry go ahead. one other thing. And then we did, uh, we did post it on our social media as well. And then one other thing is the neighborhood that is directly adjacent. Is that the secret garden neighborhood? They're, they're the neighborhood that is closest to us. It's across the interstate and it's about, um, I'd have to, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but it's uh, about three quarters, two thirds to three quarters of a mile away. Okay. Alder, it's secret places. Oh, I'm sorry. That sounds better. Um, Okay, thank you very much. Is is oh, we're not ready for staff, are we, Mayor? Not yet. Okay, well, we'll then, get there. Then. Thank you, Mr. Welch. I'm done with my questioning. Thank you, Alder. Any additional questions for any of the registrants on this item? Seeing none, then. We will go on to item number 81, which is amending the capital budget to transfer borrowing uh, from reconstruction streets to right-of-way landscaping uh, regarding medians. I'll note that there's a sub on this item. We have one registrant wishing to speak, Bob Schaefer of District 17. Yes, thank you, Mayor and Alders. Um, my my concern with this is that um, in the uh, actual documentation, it, it reports that uh, the primary reason for doing this is for the safety of the people who have to take care of the greens and the gardens and so forth like that. Um, that is a concern, but it's a concern I think that can be uh, resolved by uh, doing the work in non-rush hour times where the left lane of traffic can be blocked by their vehicles, the city vehicles that are out there uh, 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 with the tools for the people that are doing it. The other part of that problem is that when those um, uh, are 
build over the concrete that what happens then when we have big rains and everything like that, all that water has to then flow back into the street rather than down and percolating down into the ground. So now we have more water in the streets and things like that, which could uh, end up causing uh, accidents um, with uh, people, um, you know, getting caught in, in the water or spraying it up. Um, and so I really think that there's another solution for that. And if we're really concerned about the people uh, being out there working uh, on the uh, median strips, then what about the people that are on the medians waiting for the bus rapid transit that moves down through the through the uh, left lane there? Aren't those people also gonna be at risk? And are we not also at the same time considering that? Aren't we also at the same time taking the risk for people to have to try to get across to get onto that median in order to catch the bus there, especially when it's kind of running late? Or what, what happens if people are gonna be crossing to get onto that and, uh, and, and uh, going across uh, the, uh, when it's a green light for traffic? So I think that some consideration needs to be done a lot more in, in both areas. First of all, and putting concrete over that, creating less uh, filtration for the water, and also the concern and safety uh, of the people who would be, uh, if, if safety and concern is because of people in the median, then certainly the people that would be waiting uh, uh, on those uh, for the buses uh, are also going to be in a, at a safety risk. So those are the things that I think that are important to consider in this um, in this uh, in addressing this issue. I thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for our registrant? Seeing none. Uh, next item is item ninety two. Uh, which is directing engineering staff to proceed with renovations at the Zaya Road location for a temporary shelter. We have one registrant wishing to speak, Bob Shaper of District 17. Yes, uh, uh, and that it puzzles me why the city is going to be spending $500,000 uh, to uh, upgrade or do th things there. What's going to happen with that site once the uh, actual plan site uh, over on Barkillen is completed. Then what's going to happen with that uh, Sabre site? Um, and we go back to the real main reason why this is being done. The reason that this is being done is to make uh, it possible to start working on the public market. And I've given that more thought. And while it is not a particular thing of this uh, resolution here, that um, the uh, when we look at the homeless, and their need for shelter, that they're accustomed to being sheltered at the first street location. And so if that gets put in the public market, it is still gonna be very convenient for them uh, with the rest of the services that are out there to seek shelter during the daytime uh, when it gets hot or cold or rainy, uh, to seek shelter within the public market. Uh, I'm not sure how this is going to work with the number of people that might be frequenting that, or whether in the long run that people that's what's going to happen and people will stay away from there. Either that or you can uh, make it so that you get, won't let homeless people in there during that time. And I don't know whether that's going to fly either. So I think that there's a lot more that needs to be considered in this. And it's just a matter of shuffling people around and treating them like cattle. All right. All are there any questions for our registrant on item 92? Seeing none, our next item for public comment is item 96, amending the Schenck at Woodstock Weather Worthington Park neighborhood plan regarding the Linden Avenue site. Our first registrant is Bruce Becker of District 15. Bruce, you should see a prompt to unmute. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, no comments at this time. All right, uh, any from Barbara? Barbara Becker of District 15. Yeah, thank you. I just kind of want to piggyback um, the comments that I made previously. And I, we totally appreciate the mission of the church. Um, I know this is supposed to be about the NPA, but 
Um, I just kind of want to piggyback those comments. The mission of the church is admirable, but it is totally irrelevant to how this property is zoned. Um, and as someone who's lived in my house for over 40 years, I wonder why there's more consideration being given to increasing density in a manner that's not supported by the infrastructure than to the people who have sustained our neighborhood for so many years, decades, in fact. So I guess, you know, I would just ask the commission, the commissioners and the city council, as is in their, you know, at the top of their agendas always says who benefits, who's burdened who does not have a voice at the table, and how can policymakers mitigate unintended consequences? I really hope they will consider all those things because we feel um, totally unheard. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Terry Kahn of District 6 to be followed by Sandy Blankney. Hi, um, I just have a couple more comments about the amendment. I made some earlier as stated by many, this amendment is for one parcel for one particular development to benefit the developer. If it were not for this development, this amendment would not be up for discussion at this time. The amendment is very specific regarding size and height, which is not anywhere in our neighborhood plan or most plans. Instead, there are statements in neighborhood plans that reflect the type of development and land use. And one of the alders asked, um, the definition of missing middle housing. And it describes a range of multifamily or clustered housing types that are compatible in scale with single family or transitional neighborhoods. Missing middle housing is intended to meet the demand for walkable neighborhoods responding to changing demographics and providing, providing housing at different price points. The term missing middle is meant to describe housing types that were common in pre-World War II. United States, such as duplexes, row homes, and courtyard apartments, but are now less common and therefore missing. Rather than focusing on the number of units in a structure, missing middle housing emphasizes scale and heights that are appropriate for single family neighborhoods or transition, transitional neighborhoods. And this is uh, quoted from a 2020 source, missing middle housing, thinking big and building small to respond to today's housing crisis. And similar to the architect's missing renderings for speedway development mentioned, there's no rendering of the houses on division. Remember, there are only step backs from two to three stories on three sides of the building. There's none on the south side. And because of the slope from Dunning to division, it is actually as tall as three and a half stories. This is directly next to a one-story house heading south. Next is a one and a half story house and on Atwood Avenue, a two story commercial building. I find that it was intentional that these renderings were not shown to you. The densest re residential zoning code that is used for medium residential is TRU1. TRU2 has been used on parcels designated for high residential. TRU1 on the 2165 Linden parcel is for a density of 58 units per acre. Yet what is being proposed is 70 units per acre. So you're really skipping all over uh, middle housing, unlike what the developer claimed. So I appreciate the Alder for asking what is missing. I believe that um, this amendment is inappropriate and I hope that you um, oppose it. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Our next registrant is Sandy Blakeney of District 6 to be followed by Matt Becker. Hi, um, this is Sandy. Um, thank you. I appreciate the chance to supplement my earlier statement. Um, I've been so disappointed to hear the speakers trying to emphasize the so-called collaborative process in the creation of this building design. The reality is that I live a half a block away from the site, and I never received any information about the site being sold from alders, from the church, from threshold, from corrupt, from anybody um, about the proposed development until late last fall. To know that one neighbor and two of the developers spoke tonight in favor does not mean that the neighborhood in general is supportive of this zoning change. To say that the neighbors were given multiple opportunities for input over a long period of time is simply not true. And the emphasis on it now is an attempt to assure you that all due diligence has been completed. The neighborhood plan amendment never would have even existed, but for the fact that at the very last minute, staff, alders, and the developer figured out that the proposal was not consistent 
with the neighborhood plan. So again, I would urge you to vote against it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Matt Becker of District 6, to be followed by Madeline Gottkowitz. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, great, thanks. My name is Matt Becker and my wife Erica and I live across the street from Zion Church on the corner of Linden and Division Street. Uh, we support the project and the development for a few reasons. First, there's a housing crisis in Dane County in the, in the country overall, and this project will add some much needed housing. Even if it's just a little bit, every bit helps. Second, the builder plans to use industry leading sustainability methods and he plans to scale those building methods to future developments um, down the road. And then finally, I, I guess, you know, to, to offer a different perspective than other speakers, I, I do think there's been a good faith process effort here between the developer, the alder and the neighbors to find mutual compromise related to the project. And we value uh, the gains of that process overall. So I guess uh, I'd like to hit a few of the highlights of the process that have happened over the last year plus. Um, the, there was a, one of the big first meetings was one that Brian Benford organized last June um, between Krupp and the neighborhood, the neighborhood to look at potential designs to get feedback. Shortly after that meeting, a listserv was created specific to the Zion project to keep the discussion going. Today, there are 64 members of that listserv, and over the last year, more than 500 emails have been exchanged about this project. Um, giving feedback, discussion, commentary, planning, um, the ins and outs uh, of different types of zoning and plan amendments um, and so on. Um, continuing through last summer, there were various meetings and activity happening. There were two neighborhood surveys to capture neighborhood preferences. There was a door-to-door -door effort to talk to neighbors and get others involved. Um, and then the results of those surveys and those conversations were tried uh, were worked on by the neighbors to distill into a set of preferences that were then um, shared with the developer to attempt to align the neighborhood preferences to the project overall. Last fall, late October, uh, Krupp gave us his last and final development proposal. Um, and we shared that in a broader neighborhood meeting. And that development proposal did include some of those neighborhood preferences, not all of them, of course, but some of the key preferences, including uh, a a three-story building with third floor setback, environmentally sustainable features, fully parked, traffic mitigation, townhome style, et cetera. So um, I hope that description and maybe some of the specifics there were helpful. Alder Foster jumped in late last year, and he has attended various meetings on this topic, provided email information, and uh, worked hard to understand the issues that are going on here. Um, Big picture, I would say that there's been a lot of feedback provided, many, many emails, many, many meetings, many, many hours spent talking about the ins and outs of um, all of these types of topics that we're talking about today. Uh, that's all I wanted to cover, and I appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Madeline Gottkowitz of District 15, to be followed by Linda Lenhertz. I have no additional comments. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Lenhertz of District 6. Linda Star 6. Hello. Um, this neighborhood plan amendment calls for stories and 70 dwelling units per acre should be accommodated. This is not how neighborhood plans are normally amended. For example, one of the recent amendments for Tenny Lapham specified high residential. This is specifying adult development density and height. Um, and this amendment appears to have been used in order to accommodate this specific proposal, which would have approved to have a density of 68 units per acre. The, the neighborhood plan talks about such a redevelopment would provide a gradual transition from four-story mixed-use building immediately to the south to the one- and two-story homes. This gradual transition would only be a transition for about half the length of the parcel. The four-story building is only 120 feet in length, and the remainder of what would be the back of 2165 Linden is a 33-foot driveway and 87 feet of a TRV1 zoned lot that contains a one-story single-family dwelling. 
And it also doesn't really provide much of a transition because where it abuts the four-story building on Atwood, there's a transition of only seven feet. It's also worth noting that this four-story building, from which it's providing a transition, received several conditional use approvals. One was for height, and another one was for not requiring the required step backs at the back of the property, um, step backs that are normally required when abutting a residentially zoned parcel. For both approvals, the church was used as a comparison, but with the church going away, this is still a size building that may not have been able to be developed, but for the church. There are several policy statements in there talking about places of worship, so what to do with them and other large sites. Um, does that really belong in a neighborhood plan? Um, there's a general policy statement regarding future developments. Again, is that a policy statement that um, applies to a neighborhood plan? One thing I do want to mention about the proposed development itself, it specifies under the zoning text, TSS uses, not only permitted, but also all conditional uses and all accessory uses. I'm failing to understand why a building that's just going to be a purely residential building would need these TSS uses. Um, and it could make a difference in the future. If it's TSS uses, it could flip some point in the future to a hotel or some other use. So um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for any of the registrants on item 96? Seeing none. On item 98, amending the O'Hara Hills Neighborhood Development Plan, we have one registrant wishing to speak, Catherine Coates. Uh, Catherine's no longer in the list. Oh, okay. And then that is the end of our public comment. President Furman. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to move a 10 minute recess. Is there a second? Again. <laughs> Excuse me, that's seconded. Is there any objection to taking a 10 minute recess? Seeing no objection, we will take a 10 minute recess. That brings us back at 9.29.
All right. If we could get Alders to come back and turn their cameras on, please. And I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Alder Wahelia. Here. Alder Wahelia is here. Alder Abbas. Alder Abbas. Alder Alvarez. Here. Alder Alvarez is here. Alder Benford. Present. Alder Benford is here. Alder Bennett is excused. Alder Carter. Alder Carter. Alder Conklin. Present. Alder Conklin is here. Vice President Curry. Here. Vice President Curry is here. Alder Evers. Here. Alder Evers is here. Alder Figueroa Cole. Here. Alder Figueroa Cole is here. Alder Foster. Here. Alder Foster is here. President Furman. Present. President Furman is here. Alder Halverson. Present. Alder Halverson is here. Alder Harrington McKinney. I'm here. Alder Harrington McKinney is here. Alder Heck. Here. Alder Heck is here. Alder Lemmer. Here. Alder Lemmer is here. Alder Martin. Here. Alder Martin is here. Alder Miyadze. Alder Miyadze. Alder Verveer. Here. Alder Verveer is here. Alder Vitiver. Present. Alder Vitiver is here. Alder Abbas. Alder Carter. Present. Alder Abbas present, please. Alder Abbas is present. Alder Carter. And Alder Miyadze. We have quorum. Thank you. All right. So having made it through public comment, we're on to item number three, which is Legistar 70694, approving plan specifications and a schedule of assessments for Toke Boulevard Resurfacing Assessment District of 2022. President Furman, a motion, please. Move adoption. Second. It's so moved and seconded to adopt. Are there questions for staff on this item? Seeing none, is there any discussion? Alder Martin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I don't have much to say. I just really want to thank uh, staff and um, uh, your office as well for working together to try to find a, a solution that benefits um, as many people as we could possibly accommodate. This has not been an easy process. And I really commend um, city staff for working really hard to try to come to a, a different solution. They, they did a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. I want to recognize your efforts here as well. I appreciate it. Any further discussion? Seeing none, is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of item three. And that will take us to item six. Item six is Legistar 69519, amending the City of Madison official map to establish reservations, excuse me, to establish reservations for future streets uh, consistent with recommendations in the adopted Oscar Mayer special area plan. Uh, President Furman, a motion, please. Uh, refer substitute to the Transportation Policy and Planning Board on June 6th, the Plan Commission on June 13th, and the Common Council on June 21st. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded to refer. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of referral? Seeing no objection, we'll record that vote. That will take us to item 11, uh, which is Legistar 70259 uh, regarding a new license at Liberty Square gas station at doing business as Refuel Pantry at 4222 East Washington. On item 11, President Furman, a motion, please. Move grant with conditions. So second. The second. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Uh, Alder Vitiver. Questions? 
sorry, discussion. Are there any questions? Not seeing any, Alder, go ahead. Um, so apologies, I am the one who um, asked this to be excluded. Um, and I wanna make two apologies before discussing that. First is to the business owners. Um, I know that this likely comes as a surprise to them. They probably thought this was sort of a standard fare um, and it's really not fair to them to be bringing this forward at this point. Um, and the second is to Alder Halverson, who um, I did give a heads up that I was going to bring this forward, um, but only a few hours, many hours ago now, <laughs> earlier in the day. Um, and that's because the initial information that we were given was that this was a Class A license and it was given with a map of other alcohol licenses, but was not delineated Class A versus Class B licenses. And I received that information today. And um, so I really just want to bring this forward um, to this body to really start having some really thoughtful considerations around alcohol density, uh, particularly around Class A licenses. There are four Class A licenses within a matter of blocks of this new license that's requested. Um, it is also um, just a couple of blocks from the Zaire Road site for the temporary shelter for men experiencing homelessness. Um, and there are a number of very significant health concerns when we talk about alcohol density. I was just on a webinar today um, where a public health professional was talking about uh, an area in California where they reduced alcohol density by 50%, and they saw dramatic declines in uh, domestic abuse, child abuse, liver cancer, mouth cancer, and OWI cases. So really my goal in bringing this forward was just to ask that this body um, thoughtfully consider whether we need more um, Class A licenses in such a dense area. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Is there any further discussion? Alder Halverson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, although I appreciate my esteemed colleague from District 5's interest in District 17 and the concerns about the alcohol densities, um, in this particular case, this is with a condition that is for wine and cider only. And uh, knowing that coming out of a pandemic, small businesses are struggling, especially small businesses owned by people of color. This is something we need to consider as well when we look at these types of situations. And so for this particular uh, location, I believe that this is uh, an appropriate condition and this is an appropriate for what they are asking for. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Furman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, hopefully somebody can uh, clarify uh, something I just heard. Um, I believe the license we are giving is for Class A beer as well as Class A liquor, but the liquor license is limited to wine and cider sales only. Just want to make, make it clear that it is, uh, I think, both beer and liquor. Uh, there like is a condition version. that the Class A liquor license is limited to wine and cider sales only. Uh, that's on the agenda, but Alder Revere, who often has all of the information on these things, could speak to that. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do appreciate Alder Person Lewidar's uh, concern and interest in this. I just want to state at the outset that my understanding is, is that this is an existing convenience store with gasoline sales. Uh, and so the only expansion that they're proposing is from a Class A beer to a class A beer uh, and a class A liquor license that's restricted as you just articulated to wine and cider sales only, that's hard cider. So uh, to uh, I can understand the confusion for those of you that haven't had the privilege of serving on the Alcohol License Review Committee under chapter 125 of the state statutes, class A beer, and class A liquor licenses are completely separate and distinct in, a, in an establishment such as this one that was recently purchased or assumed to be purchased. Uh, uh, if they wish to offer beer and wine, have to have both a Class A beer license and a separate Class A liquor license. There's no such thing as a Class A uh, uh, wine license. And so that's why we have to add that condition. I'll further uh, mention uh, that back in 2009, the city council prohibited any establishment selling motor vehicle fuels from um, being able to uh, be licensed to sell any spirits. Uh, and we did that because we thought that it would, could encourage or facilitate alcohol related driving offenses if gas stations or convenience stores with gas pumps uh, had, had uh, spirits for sale right there. So that's codified in chapter 38 now. Hope I answered all the questions. 
Thank you, Alder. Appreciate it. Is there any further discussion on item 11? Seeing none has been moved and seconded to grant with conditions. Is there objection to recording a unanimous vote? Alder Vitiver? Just count me as a no. We'll record Alder Vitiver as voting no. Uh, with that exception, is there any objection to recording I votes? Seeing no objection, we'll record that as uh, I votes except for Alder Vitiver. And then uh, by number, the next item is item 21, but I'll remind you that we need to take up item 96 first. So uh, we are going to go to item 96. Just give me a sec on the pages here, which is Legistar 69937, amending the Schenck at Woodstock Weather Worthington Park neighborhood plan to add a land use recommendation for the northern half of the block bounded by Linden Avenue, Atwood Avenue, Division Street, and Dunning Street for future redevelopment to be medium residential as shown on the plan amendment and map. Um, and uh, we will start uh, with a presentation from staff, which I believe will address both item 96 and item uh, 21. So we can discuss it all at once. Um, then we'll come back just to talk about item 96 and go from there. Heather? Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Alders. Um, uh, I will keep this brief, but wanted to provide a few visuals to help to uh, remind all of us about the context and also the process for what is a rare, but I wanna stress not unique way of moving forward with a particular redevelopment that involves um, first consideration of a plan amendment uh, uh, specific to that site. I'll just share a few slides with you here. First, uh, again, setting the context, uh, this is the location of the Linden Street property. It's about a half acre site right in the Atwood neighborhood. Atwood Avenue is here, uh, surrounded by not just single family homes, but a mix of single two and three family homes uh, to, the, to the north and as well as the east and west. Uh, this is just a quick aerial view of same. Uh, here's yet another similar view, but showing the conference of plan, the underlying generalized future land use recommendations in our conference of plan. So as you've heard this evening, the site currently does show as recommended for low residential, consistent with the, the residential uses around it. Um, and again, the contemplation of redevelopment of the church site was really not taken into account during the comprehensive plan process. Um, as it wasn't 20 years ago when the neighborhood plan was adopted. But this is where we are today with regard to that future land use recommendation. Um, and here's the, the zoning. Uh, again, right in line, this is zoned TRV1, which allows one to four unit buildings, uh, similar to the, the properties around it to the north. Uh, this is traditional shopping street along most of the Atwood corridor, so much more intensive uh, mixed-use development zoning uh, immediately to the south. Um, here's just a quick context picture from, from Google showing the, the church today uh, with the sides of the homes across Linden Avenue to the north. And I just want to toggle back to uh, the architect's visual here to show uh, the closest I can come to the same angle here. So again, here's what we have today. Uh, this is the best view of the renderings that were, were shared with you earlier this evening that really shows what the, what the new development would be like uh, along Linden. Just two other context uh, Google images here. Uh, this is looking at the parking lot uh, behind the stop sign here. Um, badly placed stop sign. Uh, the parking lot next to the church uh, today. And then finally, and, and I think this is important to show, this is the four-story building that's been constructed in the past decade, um, you know, much more recently than the adoption of the neighborhood plan, certainly. But I think that this is the case that uh, uh, the plan commission certainly saw that a transition from this four-story building to the three-story building, stepping down to two and then across the street to the, the homes across the street made some sense. Um, 
this slide, I, I do want to show the cover of the, the year 2000 Schenck Atwood Starkweather Worthington Park neighborhood plan and, and stress again that at that time, redevelopment of this site hadn't been contemplated and there is no specific recommendation for the site in that plan. And then below this, and this is really important, our comprehensive plan within itself realizes that we don't have what it takes to constantly be uh, amending or pursuing amendments to our comprehensive plan. It's an arduous process involving uh, you know, loads of notice to a lot of surrounding communities, um, enormous amounts of time go into a comprehensive plan amendment. And we approach that uh, really five years uh, at a five-year increment between the major 10-year updates. And so we'll be approaching a comprehensive plan amendment next year. But the language here in our own comprehensive plan recognizes that uh, this that the city may not immediately be able to um, amend the comprehensive plan each and every time we we may want to or policymakers may want to. And this clause here is really important. Um, we we can instead adopt or amend our sub area plans as a supplement to the comp plan in the interim. And so that's something that, again, it's rare. We probably do this zero to three times per year as a city, but there are many examples of even site-specific plan amendments that have been done um, on the Isthmus, uh, certainly outside of the Isthmus in the far Northeast Nelson neighborhood. I, I think I sent a short list of some of the examples to Alders in an email earlier this morning. Um, there have been three amendments, for instance, to the Capitol Gateway Corridor Plan along East Washington that facilitated the development of some residential uh, uses in areas that had been planned for employment. Um, there was a significant amendment to the Tenney Lapham Neighborhood Plan back in 2014 that changed the future land use recommendation from a park to high density residential. So a really significant change there, and it was very site specific. So again, I, I just want to stress, we've heard a lot about how this is um, you know, a process that's, that's not good planning. And this isn't our favorite thing to do either. It's rare, it's not unprecedented. And I, I think it is a way that we as a city can be more nimble when we do have opportunities for, um, for context sensitive infill development. This is the proposed, the, the meat of the proposed plan amendment is indeed for the site at 2165 Linden. Um, and it does stress, uh, you know, very specific aspects of what we would expect for future development at three stories maximum and a density of 70 dwelling units per acre. And I, I do need to mention that it's ironic to hear the amount of pushback against the specificity of this plan amendment. Because during this process, my understanding from my colleague in planning um, and from the alder is that we actually were working with the alder on a much broader plan amendment that might address uh, multiple institutional uses over time. And based on feedback from SASE that we took into account very carefully, this amendment was made much more specific to this site. And I can carry forward that same thought with regard to the plan development zoning for this site. I think by and large, we wanna shy away from plan development zoning when we think other zoning districts may work well to achieve what, um, you know, you know what, our, what our plans are recommending. And in this particular case, um, we heard a lot of concerns from a lot of very engaged residents in the area that um, a conventional zoning district, such as a multifamily residential or mixed use district, might open things up way too far in case this development falls through, it would leave the site zoned and open for a wide variety of, of buildings and densities and uses. And so really, I think a lot of the specificity was driven by the deep engagement of a lot of neighboring residents in this area. Finally, um, I think this has been covered fairly well. Um, I wanna really acknowledge a lot of local leadership on this effort and I think fantastic work by a variety of alders during a very confusing time when there were a lot of changes um, re related to redistricting and the alder, manic, uh, alder, alder cycles uh, for elections. Um, way back in April of 21, which seems like a lifetime ago for some, um, 
I think outgoing Alder Rummel at that time and incoming Alder Benford worked together uh, to, to meet with the applicant and, and the church. Um, and planning staff was at that meeting back in April of 2021. And that was the first one where planning staff was engaged. Um, then Alder Benford uh, hosted a June 2021 neighborhood meeting. And then there was a lot of, uh, of leadership by uh, a neighborhood resident who was able to pull together a neighborhood focus group that planning staff attended once. I understand there were subsequent meetings not attended by staff. Um, uh, late last year in December, uh, Alder Foster and Brad Hinkfist, one of the local neighborhood leaders and the applicant met again with, with planning staff. Um, and then finally in March, uh, the Sassy neighborhood meeting included a specific mention of the neighborhood plan amendment. Um, and my understanding is that while staff didn't attend their April meeting, it was discussed at that meeting as well um, with the changes and the, the substitute that Alder Foster uh, directed staff to prepare. Process-wise, I just wanna make an, another uh, clarification that the plan amendment should be taken up by the council um, prior to consideration of the rezoning. Um, the plan commission did vote unanimously on April 25th to support the plan amendment. And if approved, it would be adopted as a supplement to the comprehensive plan, and it could inform not only the current proposal uh, before the council tonight, but any, any future redevelopment of the site. And uh, the plan amendment itself requires just a simple majority vote to pass this evening. And then depending on the outcome of that, uh, the second item then to take up would be the rezoning itself, agenda item 21, uh, a rezoning of the site from TRV1 to planned development. Um, again, after careful consideration and lots of discussion, the plan commission did vote unanimously on April 25th to support this rezoning with the explicit finding that the standards for plan development zoning could be met. Um, one of the important conditions that was added on the floor of the plan commission for you to consider um, was a new condition that the applicant must provide a pre-construction passive house certification. So basically, they need to demonstrate that their design for the building is doing everything it can to meet the passive house standards. And then post-construction, there will be another test um, to see whether passive house has, has been achieved. But the plan commission's really focused on making sure that these commitments to sustainable building are followed through on. And this is possible due to uh, the applicant seeking that plan development zoning, uh, one of the uh, the standards within the plan development zoning speaks to sustainable building elements. Um, importantly, the Urban Design Commission has granted initial approval after seeing this project a few times, um, but it would return to the UDC for final approval of the design um, pending council action this evening. And then finally, uh, as most of you are aware, there was a protest petition filed on this item, um, so it would require a supermajority or three quarters vote to pass this evening. I'll leave it there and happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Are there questions for staff on this item? Alder Abbas. Thank you very much, uh, Director Stauder. Uh, my question is about uh, about this and your item. So this, if this is uh, approved, then this is become the amendment to the comprehensive plan, correct? So it would be an amendment to the 2000 uh, Shank Atwood, Starkweather, Worthington Park plan, but it would be adopted as a supplement to our comprehensive plan, correct? Perfect. And what does the state law requirement is if we are, if we are adding as a supplement to a comprehensive plan? Uh, I heard a lot of comments from the public participation, like the meeting was not being conducting, conducted to discuss about that aspect of the comprehensive plan? What is the state law around it? Sure, if, if the city were to make um, an actual amendment to its comprehensive plan, we would need to inform and officially notice our surrounding municipalities. Um, and the process would be, would be much more robust. Again, we, we plan to approach that next year. There is no state law requiring um, any particular notice or a number of meetings related to a sub-area plan amendment like the council has before them right now. However, and perhaps Alder Foster can speak to this as well, but my understanding is that 
on March 10th, and then again in April, the SASE Neighborhood Association did cover the topic of the neighborhood plan um, at their meeting, at their meetings. So those meetings were organized uh, and meeting invitation was sent to discuss about the project or, or it was discussed about the classification of comprehensive plan? Looks like perhaps Alder Foster like Alder Foster, okay. do you want to answer that? Yeah, uh, and thanks for that question. Yeah, um, I mean, essentially, these these two items have been connected through the, the neighborhood engagement process. So um, I don't know if everyone was able to see Brad Hinkfuss's, um email that he sent today. He was really leading that, that effort. And as he shared there, um, it, was, it was always understood that a, a change to the uh, neighborhood plan would be required, but it basically was pushed until the end until a um, a specific proposal was um, was come to. So when I um, I got an update on the proposal probably in December um, prior to the redistricting change, and so worked together with Elder Benford, um, who was um, ending there to work with staff to draft the required change. Um, we, we um, SASE Neighborhood Association had it on their March agenda. So it was basically both topics. It was review of the development proposal as well as the um, neighborhood plan amendment. Um, at that meeting, there was concern expressed that folks wanted more time to consider the plan amendment. Um, and so they asked for that. I uh, told them that I would, I would uh, ask for referral of that item uh, to give extra time to give an extra month. And they charged uh, Brad Hinkfuss with setting up an additional uh, neighborhood meeting in between or before their April meeting to again discuss both the project as well as the plan amendment. Uh, that meeting did happen. And then it came back to the April uh, Neighborhood Association meeting for a report out from their preservation development committee, which recommended approval of both the project and uh, the plan amendment. And then the, um, and, and there was additional discussion there. And then the SASE Neighborhood Association uh, did not take any formal action as is their practice for controversial uh, development projects. But so yes, it was sort of formally reviewed uh, three times through the Neighborhood Association. Thank you very much, uh, Aldo Foster. Thanks for explaining uh, in detail. Uh, one question, uh, Director Stouder, is about this plan development plan amendment and moving to, you know, PD zoning. Did the mailing card was sent to all the participants because sometimes neighbor association reach out to people, but it does not. Not everybody is engaged with neighbor association. So I'm curious if the mailing card was sent. You're, you're curious whether an alder sent a, a postcard for yes. neighborhood meetings? Yes. I, I would I would be shocked if that didn't happen when Alder Benford was the alder here for that first neighborhood meeting, um, I believe back in 2021. Looks like he's nodding. Okay. No, I appreciate that. No, I am talking about specifically changing the comp plan to plan development, informing neighbors through a mailing card. Does that happen? Alder, again, it's not an amendment to the comp plan, it's an amendment to the neighborhood plan? Yes, yes, that's what I'm asking. So I think as Alder Foster just mentioned, the folks that were really involved in this process, we're really seeing this as two related items, the amendment to the neighborhood plan, and then also the rezoning of the property, which ended up being to plan development zoning. Um, and of course, there, there was ample notice to folks on the, um, on the plan development zoning uh, that's before you tonight as well. Okay, oh, I appreciate that. There's so much comments we heard about the public input process. So I want to get that clarity. So I appreciate the answers to the question and also to Alder Foster as well. Thanks. Thanks Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney, questions for staff? Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, Director Stout, I just want to make sure because uh, we had a lot of, lot of conversation about a uh, workaround. Um, is this considered a, uh, and I'm just asking because I, I need the information, is this considered a uh, workaround, the comprehensive plan? I know that you said this in a compre 
comprehensive plan is very arduous and time consuming and all of that. Is this, my first question is that, is this considered uh, a workaround that was used in the language? And then my second question is, is that, do you foresee this being challenging for future development? And my third and final question is, is that um, incorporating these within the comprehensive plan, would that not alleviate where we landed today? Sure. So I think that, you know, it's it's fair that some share an opinion that this is a workaround. As I mentioned right up front, this is a rare process to do a site-specific sub-area plan amendment in conjunction with a redevelopment proposal. It's not unprecedented. I'd say we take on as a city probably zero to three of these per year. And I provided several examples of where those have been done um, in a similar fashion. So I think that this is an option. It's a pathway forward that the plan commission and council have at their disposal when we see an opportunity for development that makes sense due to changes that have happened in the area um, as we have not had ample staff resources to come back in and update sub-area plans. Again, this sub-area plan was done in 2000. A lot in this area has changed since. And so when that environment has changed, um, whether the physical environment right around it um, or the city's you know, growth trajectory and, and needs, this kind of amendment opportunity provides a pathway forward that the city can consider. I will be the first to agree with a lot of the uh, folks with concerns that this isn't best planning practice, but this is a, you know, a, a precedented way forward in order to, um, you know, to allow the city to be more nimble when we have an opportunity that was not anticipated um, you know, 20 years ago in, in this particular case. Do I think that this particular issue will, um, will cause concerns for future redevelopment? Um, I, I don't know. I do think that the council will have this type of issue before you again in the future. I, I would be shocked if we didn't have another site-specific plan amendment and rezoning in the coming year or two that would land before the council. That's about the pace that, that we've been seeing them recently. Um, and then finally, your last question was about folding this into the comprehensive plan. And I want to stress that that is our intent. In 2023, we'll be taking on that five-year sort of mini update to our comprehensive plan. And we'll be going in and, and um, adding into the comprehensive plan future land use map all of the neighborhood plans and sub-area plans that have been adopted since 2018 when the comprehensive plan was adopted. So for instance, the Oscar Mayer special area plan that was adopted after the 2018 comp plan. Right now our comp plan shows that site as industrial and, and we will go back in and we will make all of those changes at one time. Um, our plan is to take that on in 2023, kind of at that midpoint um, between the decennial updates of the comprehensive plan. So yes, we absolutely would plan to do that. Um, we just can't do it um, each and every time uh, the need for a plan amendment arises. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does answer my question and it just led to a follow-up question. It said, uh, because you don't have the capacity to uh, make these updates every time uh, something like this comes up, when when you are um, reviewing the comprehensive plan, um, can we have language in that that opens the door? And so um, I, I guess I'm just wary of kicking the the uh, can down the road because it comes up again, and and oftentimes it's because we didn't deal with it and we kind of put it off. And so I'm just really concerned about that because I've run into that and some something that we should have dealt with. Uh, prior to got kicked down the road and then it kind of exploded. And so, um, and maybe I'm way off, but I, but that's just what my thinking is going. No, I, I appreciate that guidance. We'll, we'll take that into account, not only with the comprehensive plan amendment, but also with regard to our, um, our new hope for a, a planning framework that's much more efficient. Um, we'll be bringing that to you in the coming uh, weeks as well. So thank you. Thank you, Alder. Any other questions for staff on this item? All right, seeing none, uh, President Furman, we need a motion. Move adoption. Is there a second? 
Vice President Curry. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Is there discussion on item 96? Alder Harrington McKinney, is your hand still up for discussion? Uh, not for discussion. I just want to have a roll call. All right. A roll call has been requested. Um, Alder Benford, discussion. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to thank Director Stouter and all planning staff. And I guess more importantly, I want to thank all the people who came out and spoke that, as it was noted tonight, that uh, this came up right after I was elected. And I don't know how many of you know that really funky shaped church. I, I do. I've walked past it for 35 years and uh, so many interesting things about this process. So I, I just want to give a tiny bit of background from my perspective, although I haven't been as involved after the redistricting after January. So uh, as Director Stouter stated that uh, former Alder Ramo and myself had an opportunity to meet with the church and the developer along with planning staff. And uh, like many, I was kind of blindsided. I had wondered, was it because of the pandemic that it looked like over the last couple of years, the building just didn't have the same energy. It looked like it was kind of falling apart, like there wasn't much involvement there. And I just kind of chalked it off to the pandemic. And then after that meeting, it kind of hit me. And I like you all to consider this, that, you know, these large churches, these faith-based institutions, because of COVID, because of a change in how parishioners worship, that this could come up. These big churches that are cash heavy to support uh, and dying congregations that um, I never thought about it until uh, I had that opportunity to meet with those folks. So like many, I was kind of shocked and didn't, as Alder, didn't want to see this building just sit and fall apart. People were using the parking lot of, with adjacent bars and it was impacting some of the immediate neighbors by not having the church in there. <clears throat> So I was feeling a little bit cavalier because it wasn't an easy lift. All the things that Director Stoddard and the amazing questions from my colleagues about the implications around this. So I was feeling cavalier that I believe that it did give me time to really engage the neighborhood. So to answer one of the questions that with the first large public meeting, uh, we did send postcards and uh, we noticed the meeting well and it was really well attended. And then uh, throughout these conversations, there was a listserv that was put together, the Zion Group, that there was tons of communication on this listserv. And I say that recognizing that not everybody had access to a computer or to this listserv. But it was amazing over the last year, some of the conversations. So as uh, Tyler Krupp stated that the original proposal was condominiums. And uh, if you know my neighborhood, uh, although I don't represent the site anymore, there's nothing cheap over here. I think someone uh, described over $300,000 for a tiny little house so as I thought of condos initially, I thought, well, wow, that's not really, these places are really not going to serve uh, historically marginalized folks or uh, folks that traditionally don't have the privilege to live in that neighborhood. But I, you know, as all there's, we can't mandate that there's going to be affordable housing. We can't tell uh, the church that you, you can't sell it to this developer or you have to do this. And during the early days, I've heard people say that, could we put a post office there? I heard uh, conversations. One person even asked me, could we put a homeless shelter there? Uh, so there was many conversations. Some people really wanted to see it go back to single family houses. So as I thought about all of this, I guess I had faith that Throughout this process, there was Brad Hinkfis was mentioned, uh, who did a really masterful job of bringing people together and helping to facilitate meetings along with other people from the Sassy Neighborhood Association. 
So out of the larger group, this core group, and in the core group was a family, a, a couple that lived right next door, bordering the parking lot. As Matt Becker spoke earlier, right across the street, another family that lived right across the street. And I hope you heard it when Tyler Krupp says that he lives across the street now with his wife. So as I thought about all of these things, it was really interesting as the conversation more from, oh, we want home ownership versus renters. And I'm a longtime renter, folks. So, you know, some of these conversations, quite frankly, uh, really were disturbing to me in the sense of like privilege and work. And, you know, as a renter, I feel that perhaps I uh, give more time to the city than most homeowners. So, you know, th there was really interesting uh, conversations that uh, showed a lot. But Throughout all of this, no matter what was built there, whether it was condos or townhouses or apartments, there's nobody that's going to rent that's going to be there for decades, like many of the speakers that came out tonight. That's just the visceral reality. So I love what someone said. It's not about buildings. I think uh, Will said it earlier. It's about the people that are living in these units. It's about the people coming in the to the neighborhood. But once again, recognizing that no one's going to have that vested time, like many of these homeowners that spoke in opposition. So I want to say that, was there a dedicated meeting toward changing the neighborhood plan? Could that had been uh, handled a little differently? I, I would maybe say yes, but once again, they're both connected. They're both connected. So, uh, when I got involved, we knew that this neighborhood plan was really old. Um, we knew that at that time, as Director Stouter said, no one thought a church would leave, right? A church seems to be bedrock for many of our neighborhoods. But once again, that reality is going to uh, come to uh, uh, come to bear for, I think, all across the city. So I want to tell you that... Uh, there was a lot of conversation and a lot of the opposition that I'm hearing, uh, not only tonight, but recently, and I don't fault them, I really don't, but it, it wasn't the voices that were there in the beginning. It wasn't the voices. It seemed like folks came in uh, late and they have a right to do that. They, they really do. So I would just urge you all to consider that um, when I think of this site, I, I don't want to dance around this. I, I sent a note out to the uh, listserv, the Zion listserv, and I, I stated that I was comfortable with the process. And more importantly, I like the project. I'm not going to mince words and shy away from it. I think that threshold and uh, because of neighborhood input and uh, the back and forth, they came up with something I am very excited about. Now, I know uh, passive houses and things like that is new to many of us, myself included, but I think that this is a great model. Not only uh, does it provide the housing that we need, especially in this neighborhood, as people say, I'm still a renter. I just live four blocks from the site. Uh, but it also uh, signals that uh, we can do these really spectacular projects when it comes to passive building. So I, I'm excited uh, about the final project. I'm comfortable with the process. Uh, I'm really grateful uh, Alder Foster jumped in uh, before the district changed and uh, uh, was directly involved in the work that he's done with others since then. So I would strongly urge you to please support this, that ultimately it's going to be an amazing building. I, I believe that in my heart. And as far as implications throughout the city, we need to keep an eye on this because uh, many of these big churches will not be here in 10 years. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Alder Foster? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we've got a really heavy agenda tonight. So I'll, I'll try and be real brief. Um, even though this has uh, been a project that's probably taken up more of my time as older than any other one I've had so far. And I only came in on the tail end of it. So uh, it was it was funny at some people 
gave their condolences when I um, took over the representation of just part of the Sassy neighborhood, and it's uh, certainly lived up to its reputation on this project. Um, really, to be brief, um, and I know it's, it can be a little bit confusing because you've heard a really wide ranging comments from folks asserting really good process, really bad process, really good project, really horrible project. Uh, from my perspective, this is absolutely uh, an excellent project. Um, I, I would be supportive of it if it didn't have the passive house uh, components to it. I think it, it through that year long process um, is very much context sensitive, um, really fits in well with the location. It's a great opportunity to add some much needed housing um, and, and it's done so really thoughtfully. Um, it, it may not be obvious with um, some of the testimony that was shared tonight, but of the six uh, parcels that are directly adjacent to across the street and including the one um, really um, right behind it, uh, three of those six have actually spoken up in, in favor um, of this project, which I actually find really surprising. I mean, I, th I think we would all not be surprised that any direct neighbors of a, of a larger scale building, um, you know, may not want to see it go up. And the fact that um, half of those that are directly you know, most impacted um, have, have actively come forward in support of the project, I think really says a lot about the process and about the project itself. Um, the uh, Really, at the end of the day, it's about outcomes. And this is just a really great opportunity to add that much needed housing. Um, I am extraordinarily excited about the passive house component. I think this is really a game changer for Madison. Um, the developer really went out of their way. I mean, this I know that this is just a true passion uh, for, for Tyler and I'm excited uh, for this to really be a launch pad for many more truly sustainable projects happening in, in Madison. It's something we have, we have to do. There's no other way um, to, to get to uh, sustainability when it comes to energy use. So that's absolutely a, a a great addition to the project. And, um, you know, you you did hear from uh, the church congregation and, you know, we certainly shouldn't approve this based on the benefits there, uh, but this is really connected with two different congregations and have been trying for many years um, to, to do what they're trying to do with their sites and to really uh, build another great project. So um, there's just a lot of community benefit. And uh, for me, there's really no question that um, approving this, this plan amendment and this uh, project uh, is overwhelmingly in the best interest of the city. And so I encourage you all to support both. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Evers. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be supporting this. Um, you know, I, I've watched with great interest the presentation. I, like many of you, have heard complaints about kind of a standard architectural design for a lot of new projects, new development projects, this kind of Lego look. Uh, the design of this project to me is stunning. It's beautiful. It's, it's, I'm reminded of the design qualities of the Bayview redevelopment project. I'd like to see more of that. Uh, also the sustainability that Alder Foster was just speaking of and how critically and, and how very important that is if we're gonna meet our 2030 climate goals that this council voted on in 2017, I believe it was, committed the city to, uh, to some really significant climate goals. But the, the, these changes or the fact that this project is of such quality, to me, it's evident it came through a process, a process with a lot of engagement with the community. And that's what's been debated, I believe, with some of the commentary and some of the complaints, but I will steer my colleagues to the email that came across our inboxes at 5.23 p.m. from Brad Hinkfus, who's the Executive Director of Housing Initiatives, knows a lot about supportive housing and affordable housing in our community and about projects in general, and has not always been supportive of development projects in, in this neighborhood. He led a lot of the engagement process from what I understand. And he says, and I'm not going to read the whole email, but he says, I have to say that this one project had stronger and more intense community involvement than any project I can recall, even more than something like Union Corners. And then it goes on to say uh, near the end here, uh, since the decision by some to oppose the project, some of what I witnessed is a recasting of the history and the process itself, often in negative terms. Issues that relate to rest, 
have been resurrected as major obstacles. People who chose not to participate in the lengthy seven month process claimed that there was no process and that they had no opportunity. I find this all unfortunate and not unlike the political events of our time. Uh, lastly, he says, make of it what you will in your final decision, but understand that there was a strong process, heavy engagement, and lots of well-informed people all along the way. Not liking the outcome does not mean that it's okay to savage the process. We've also heard from, from Heather Stouter, from Director Stouter, that this is not unprecedented in, this, in the sense of changing a neighborhood plan, making an amendment to a neighborhood plan in a situation like this. It happens uh, nearly every year. So we're, we're not talking about uh, a kind of, you know, janky workaround kind of thing. This is not untoward. The process hasn't been skewed in an unfavorable way. It's a beautiful project. It meets our sustainability goals. And listen to the folks who are talking about not being able to afford to live in our city, who want to be able to live in neighborhoods like this and want to be able to afford rents in neighborhoods like this. Listen to the voices of people who want to live in neighborhoods like this but can't afford to buy. And they, that we need more housing. We all know this. So if you're going to oppose this, you don't have a good reason to say that the process wasn't right. You have to find something else to object to. It's a beautiful project. There's some great environmental goals, and there is there's support of the current alder. There's the support of the future alder once the redistricting thing rolls over for, uh, well, excuse me, the current alder and the past alder. You know what I'm trying to say. It's an overall great project, and I encourage you all to support. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Abbas? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, thanks for uh, all the participants, their testimony, and as well as Alder Benford and Alder Foster for your community engagement. Uh, and also, I do acknowledge uh, we need Passive House all across the city with all the projects, regardless it's plan development, CCT, or whatever the zoning is, we cannot deal with our climate goals without making those changes. And the uh, buildings definitely communicate with the community and uh, it have a huge impact. So that's, that's is a given. Regarding uh, this particular project, uh, I am really, it's a difficult one. I mean, uh, you know, um, I want to support, but the biggest question as a policymaker for all of us is our comprehensive plan. And the CM we make today here, we will set the precedent that we could change comprehensive plan through plan development and either as a council, do we want to do this or not? That's something we have to decide. This is not about only this particular project, but this is also about future project. I also read the email and thought a lot about Alder Marsha Rommel email as well. And, and, she, and she mentioned, will this become a tool you and planning staff will utilize when there is a conflict with a comprehensive plan classification and real estate market forces and updated the comprehensive plan is not timely, question mark. I hope you seriously discuss the implication of this approach. And I do respect uh, Alder Rommel for her 14 year of service to City of Madison and also many year of service on plan commission. I do think so as a policymaker, that's a question in front of us. I also do understand the dire need of housing. Uh, that is me personally, in my own aldermanic district, I'm pushing for more housing, but at the same time, the plan we have created that also happened through council adopted and also happened through thousands of people participation and input. With, with that, I also heard from Director Stouder that, that they are close next year to five year time and at the five year plan, they will revise it. I think so that might be a better opportunity for all of us and um, for council as well as for the staff to see where all those gaps are, where all those properties are, which we amend or change rather than we should changing into plan development. And last but not least, this is my understanding as an alder working on Oscar Mayer special area plan and citywide I have seen many plans. The staff, the planning staff 
is moving away from planned developments. And there are many new classification of zoning. Like in Oscar Mayer case, we have NMX, which was not presented at the time when we created Oscar Mayer Special Area Plan, but those type of zonings can promote and provide opportunity for future growth and development. So with that, I am I do feel like this is not about the only passive house or about this particular project. This is about the overall process of comprehensive plan and over as a policymaker to see and do we want to change a comprehensive plan with plan developments in future, not only this project. And with that, I do think so that's a bad precedent. We should wait for the five-year plan and up, update it. So I will vote against it. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue wishing to speak. A roll call vote, oh, Alder Carter. Alder, you're muted. Mayor, I would just like for you to, are we taking 96 and 21 together? No, Alder, we have to vote on them separately. Okay, are they both? Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, just for clarification, uh, for uh, since we're voting on these two amendments separately, um, does each one of them require the 15 vote? No, Alder, this item requires 11 votes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Alder. Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be quick. Um, I, I'm concerned that there's a bit of a misunderstanding about the relationship between this item and the comprehensive plan. Uh, the, I, I don't think this, this particular item is uh, in some ways making it easier to, for plan developments to circumvent uh, 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 special area plans or the comprehensive plan. Since the zoning code was rewritten, uh, uh, 10 years ago now almost, uh, staff has definitely steered away from using PDs. Uh, if, if you look at older plan commission materials and approvals, plan PUDs as they were known then were used left and right to get around uh, neighborhood plans and, and the comprehensive plan was a different animal then. Uh, and I think rightly so that staff has steered away from that, but it's inevitable that there will occasionally be opportunities uh, that come up and, and circumstances that, that uh, where uh, cha zoning changes or PDs will come in handy and and help the city reach its goal overall goals in the comprehensive plan. One example that came up was uh, changing uh, TE zoning to residential zoning in Cap East, which is uh, going to allow hundreds of new dwelling units, and that's not in the comprehensive plan yet, but. It just made sense because the demand is so high. So I I I don't think this is a slippery slope. Uh, staff is highly aware of the fact that we shouldn't go back to the way we used to do things. So I encourage you uh, to support this. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue. So we'll move to a vote. A roll call has been requested. We are voting now on item 96, which is the amendment to the neighborhood plan uh, for uh, to add a land use recommendation um, and to amend the map. All those in favor of amending the plan will vote aye. Those opposed, no. It is an 11 vote item and the clerk will please call the roll. Mahalia. No. Wahelia is no. Abbas. No. Abbas says no. Alvarez. Yes. Alvarez says aye. Benford. Aye. Benford is aye. Bennett is excused. Carter. No. Carter is no. Conklin. Yes. Conklin is aye. Vice President Curry. Aye. Vice President Curry is aye. Evers. Aye. Evers is aye. Figueroa Cole. Aye. Figueroa Cole is aye. Foster. 
Aye. Foster is aye. President Furman. Aye. President Furman is aye. Halverson. Aye. Halverson is aye. Harrington McKinney. No. Harrington McKinney is no. Heck. Aye. Heck is aye. Lemmer. Aye. Lemmer is aye. Martin. Aye. Martin is aye. Miadzi. Aye. Miadzi is aye. Verveer. Aye. Verveer is aye. Vitiver. Aye. Vitiver is aye. I have 15 aye, four no. With 15 ayes, that item passes. And that will take us back to item 21, which is Legistar 70655, creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to rezone the property located at 2165 Linden Avenue. Um, President Furman, a motion, please. Uh, move adoption with conditions. I believe that's a second from Vice President Curry. Yes. Thank you. Uh, moved and seconded. Um, I think we won't have staff present again on this. It's the same item, but are there uh, any additional questions for staff? Seeing none, is there additional discussion? Seeing none, is there objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of item 21? Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, is this, are we in discussion? We are, we, we were briefly in discussion, Alder. We can go back there if you'd like, yes. Okay, um, I will um, not be supporting this item. Um, and I, if I, can I just go ahead and speak to this since we're in discussion? Absolutely. Um, we have all heard the opportunity. We all had the opportunity to hear and review public comments. Two things stood out for me. One, former Alder Marsha Rummel's email and the staff report by the director. Is this amendment a workaround to the comprehensive plan? Are we opening the door for future conflicts to the comprehensive plan and real estate market? Why not update the comprehensive plan as the state law requires a public participatory process, allow input, evaluate goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan? Uh, this is market rate housing and it was spoken about the missing middle. Um, uh, does not address affordable increased diversity. It is market rate, how, market rate, uh, one bedroom, $1,600 to $1,750, two bedrooms, $1,900 to $2,200. Uh, when are the loud voices that support housing for it? Where are they? This does not increase the inventory of available housing of all types. There is no investment in home ownership opportunity. It does not support the shared growth and prosperity by all residents. And it does not, um, it, there is not a question of not in my back, backyard. I will not be supporting this amendment. Thank you, Alder. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Seeing none, is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Alder Abbas? Please roll call vote. A roll call has been requested. All those in favor of item 21 will say aye. Those opposed, no, as your name is called, and the clerk will please call the roll. Wahelia. No. Wahelia is no. Abbas. No. Abbas is no. Alvarez. Yes. Alvarez is aye. Benford. Aye. Benford is aye. Bennett is excused. Carter. No. Carter is no. Conklin. Aye. Conklin is aye. Vice President Curry. Aye. Vice President Curry is aye. Evers. Aye. 
Evers is I. Figueroa Cole. I. Figueroa Cole is I. Foster. I. Foster is I. President Furman. I. President Furman is I. Halverson. I. Halverson is I. Harrington McKinney. No. Harrington McKinney is no. Heck. I. Heck is I. Lemmer. I. Lemmer is I. Martin. I. Martin is I. Miadzi. I. Miadzi is I. Verveer. I. Verveer is I. Vitiver. I. Vitiver is I. Again, 15 I. Four no. With 15 eyes, that item passes and meets the required 15 vote threshold, which will take us to item number 24. Item number 24 is Legistar 70998. It's an appeal of the Plan Commission action on the conditional use request for 3734 Speedway Road. And I believe we should start uh, with Attorney Haas to remind us um, of how we deal with appeals and uh, what we'll be voting on. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening. Um, as the consent agenda, in, or as the agenda indicates, this is, an, uh, this is an appeal of a conditional use permit approval of the plan commission. The special rule he here is that uh, the council would need 14 votes to either reject or modify the approval of the plan commission. So I believe the proper motion is still the recommended, the recommended motion is plan commission action to um, uh, approve the conditional use permit. And then you have a vote. If you have uh, 14 votes uh, to overturn that, it would take 14 votes to overturn it. Otherwise the plan commission um, um, action would stand. Thank you. Are there questions for Attorney Haas on the process here? President Furman. I'm sorry. I just want to make it clear since I'm, I'm going to be the person making a motion. I'm, it is move approval of the appeal, and then it has to get 14 votes to overturn the plan commission decision. The, there, there are two ways to do it. You, you could approve the appeal which would take 14 votes, or you can move to approve the plan commission action, which is what I propose. That, um, and, and then it would, if you, if you had uh, essentially, uh, I guess, five, six votes or more, it would be approved. Okay. But you, you, could, you, could, you could also move to approve, approve the appeal, um, and then that would take 14 votes. If it has less than 14 votes, it fails. Okay. And the I, think plan commission action I think that's a less confusing action, so I'm okay. going to go forward with that. Thank we you. Thank that. you, Attorney Haas. Thank you. Alder Figueroa call questions? I think they were answered. I was a little bit confused. I mean, that's how we've done it on the past, right? Yes. We just vote on the petition in front of us. And to pass it, we need 14 votes. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Sorry, it's a little bit late. Nope, no problem. Thank I you. wanted to make sure everybody's <laughs> clear on the process and we'll revisit it again right before we vote. Um, are there questions for staff on the content? Not seeing any. Uh, so then President Furman, let's get that motion on the floor, please. Move approval of appeal. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the appeal, which would overturn the plan commission's decision. Is there discussion? Alder Vitiver. I uh, just wanted to um, clarify a few things that were brought up by residents. Um, it is true that there is uh, less parking than units in this um, proposal, and that was uh, stated from the beginning uh, in part to try to meet our climate goals as a city to promote walkability, bikeability, and busability. Uh, there was in the original Metro Transit redesign plan um, a suggestion to reduce the service along Midvale and I'm sorry, Mineral Point and Speedway to only rush hour service. In the amendments 
to the Metro redesign that was that bus service that's currently happening now that's all day service has been restored. So um, just to be clear, there will be bus service to this area literally across the street. Well, depending on where you go, if you're going towards the Capitol, you cross the street. If you're going towards, you know, West Town Mall, it'll be on the same side of the street as the building. Um, they developer has worked to try to, as you heard, engage a uh, local businesswoman to provide the services that would be walkable to the residents in the area to have a sort of a convenience store type of thing. Um, I know there was concern about whether there was ample enough parking in the area for a business like that. Um, I'll point out that um, where I live, I'm just a few blocks from Regent Market that also has almost no parking for it, and it is primarily utilized by residents walking to it, um, which is really what we want to encourage is a, is a walkable city. So this is um, really a, a development that is in keeping with um, most of our city goals, including building housing and bringing density to a desirable area. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Is there further discussion on this item? Seeing no further discussion, the, and let me be perfectly clear here. The motion is to overturn, to, to accept the appeal and overturn the plan commission, which means that you do not want the project to go forward, right? So an, an I vote uh, revokes permission for this project and overturns the plan commission. A no vote uh, affirms the plan commission's decision and allows the project to go forward. I'm just pausing to see if anybody has questions. Okay, everybody's nodding. So uh, all those, all those in favor uh, of the appeal, aye. Those opposed, no. As your name is called, and the clerk will please call the roll. Can you repeat, Madam Mayor? Please. Oh, I will repeat one more time. An I vote overturns the plan commission and stops the project. A no vote agrees with the plan commission and allows the project to go forward. One more time. An I vote overturns the plan commission decision and stops the project. A no vote agrees with the plan commission and allows the project to go forward. All in favor, aye. When you and those opposed, no. When your name is called, and the clerk will please call the roll. Alder Bahalia. Come back to me, please. Will do. Abbas. No. Abbas, no. Alvarez. If you could swing back, that'd be great. Benford. No. Benford, no. Bennett is excused. Carter. Come back to me. Conklin. Come back to me. Kerr, uh, Vice President Curry. No. Vice President Curry is no. Evers. No. Evers is no. Figueroa Cole. No. Figueroa Cole is no. Foster. No. Foster is no. Furman. No. Furman is no. Halverson. No. Halverson is no. Harrington McKinney. Harrington McKinney? I abstain. Harrington McKinney abstains. Heck. No. Heck is no. Lemmer. No. Lemmer is no. Martin. No. Martin is no. Miazzi. And Miazzi. No. Miazzi is no Ververe. No. Ververe is no Vitiver. No. Vitiver is no Wahelia. No. Wahelia is no Alberus. No. Alberus is no Carter. Abstain. Carter abstains. Conklin. No. Conklin is no. I have 17 no, two abstentions. 
Right. Uh, with 17 no's, the motion fails. The Plans Commission's decision is upheld. And we will move on to item 28, which is Legistar 71242, submitting Alder Committee appointments. President Furman. Move adoption. Second. It's moved and seconded. Uh, is there discussion? Yes, Madam Mayor. Alder Wahelehe. Um. Before I uh, give my comments, I may have uh, may I ask questions about the process. Uh, yes, you may have questions for staff. Uh, yes, so I would like to ask what was the uh, process, the selection process for this appointment and what were the, um, particularly the finance and the plan commission. Uh, as we can see, uh, we are in the process of uh, appointing an alder for District 3, and we have the interviews uh, set up for the 17th, and if appointment goes through the 24th. And, you know, selecting those particular positions, I just want to know what was the process. Alder, the process for these appointments is the same process for all alder appointments. This is a mayoral appointment. It's my decision. And I submit them to you for confirmation. Um, if you wish to vote against them, if the majority of the council wishes to vote against them, it simply sends them back to my office where I will submit them, uh, submit them again to you. Okay. And if that's the case, you know, I would like to uh, speak to the reason why I pulled this uh, uh, particular uh, item. I feel like there is no transparency, accountability, and collaboration among all elders. Uh, there was no uh, process that recognized individual differences, diverse talent, diverse experience, diverse background, and diverse constituents. As you can see, we are all coming from different walks of life and different background. And I feel like there was no uh, process that has been uh, adhere to that. Uh, there was no equity where there was an opportunity for all elders to be given the opportunity to ask for participation. And also it was just felt like it was just handpicked. Uh, the inclusion process did not create an environment for which some elders could fully participate. And finally, I would like to recommend to hold on to this uh, appointment and uh, revisit and, you know, take back to the office, to your office, for other recommendations. Thank you, Alder. Is there any further discussion? Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, is there any objection if I speak from the chair? Seeing no objection. Again, I just emphasize these are mayoral appointments. Uh, these are my appointments to make. Obviously, you can vote however you wish to vote on them. Um, there is no requirement or process for consultation. Um, it, you know, it's up to, frankly, the mayor if she or he wishes to consult with alders on their appointments. Um, I have done that uh, in the past. I did the, that in this case. And Alder Hillehe, if you would like to know why I did not choose to appoint you to either of these appointments, I'd be happy to discuss that with you privately. I think probably you would not like that to be discussed on the council floor. Um, but honestly, this is it, this is the process. These are my choices. Um, and I hope that you as a council um, will approve your colleagues who are willing to serve in these positions. Um, there will be more appointments coming next time given the vacancies that we have, which leave a number of seats on committees open. Uh, and while I have the floor, I will just take the opportunity to remind us all that we have yet to fully tackle the process of reducing our number of boards, commissions, and committees, uh, which would reduce the number of aldermanic appointments. And I really do feel like that's something that deserves attention um, because at this point I have alders coming to me and asking me to take them off of committees because of the workload, which I am of course happy to try and accommodate. Um, but at some point, you know, we can't have too many vacant seats. So we, we really do need to address that process going forward. Thank you. 
All the way, Hilly Hay, for the second time on the item. Yes, thank you. I am not making this comment just because I was not picked for either the plan commission or the finance commission. I'm just questioning about the process. And the process, as many can see, when you are choosing a particular group because of the uh, nature of how they vote with particular block of groups, I think that's a disadvantage to many. And it's not because of me not being selected. But what I'm talking about is when you have an aldermanic position that's opened, I'm talking about equity. Equity means the person who should be serving that district is not given an opportunity to serve on those commissions or boards. And if we have the process that the interview process is going on next week and the appointment is going the following week for appointment, I don't understand what's the rush. It's not just because you didn't select me. I just asked you to appoint me and I understand you don't have to select me because I might not vote with you. And that's one of the reasons I, I could see. But saying what I have to say is when you talk about opportunity and access, we have to wait for the person who is vacating this position. And if we have an individual who is coming to the council who might have experience in plant commission, who might have experience in finance, and they were not given an opportunity because you just handpicked those people who are close to you, I don't think that's an equity and that's a fair process. So with that, I will encourage other individual, you know, uh, 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 alders not to vote on this. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. You're certainly entitled to your opinion. It's been moved and seconded. Is there objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no, uh, Alder Abbas? Yeah, please do a roll call vote. A roll call has been requested. All those in favor, aye. Those opposed, no. As your name is called, and the clerk will please call the roll. And Wahelia? No. Wahelia, no. Abbas? No. Abbas, no. Alvarez? Aye. Alvarez, aye. Benford? Aye. Benford, aye. Bennett is excused. Carter? Come back to me. Conklin? Aye. Conklin, aye. Vice President Curry. Aye. Vice President Curry is aye. Evers. Aye. Evers, aye. Figueroa Cole. Aye. Figueroa Cole, aye. Foster. Aye. Foster, aye. President Furman. Aye. President Furman, aye. Halverson. No. Halverson, no. Harrington McKinney. No. Harrington McKinney, no. Heck. Aye. Heck, aye. Lemmer. Aye. Lemmer, aye. Will do. Martin. Aye. Martin, aye. Miyadzi. No. Miyadzi, no. Ververe. Aye. Ververe, aye. Vitiver. Aye. Vitiver, aye. Returning to Carter. No. Carter, no. That is six no. 13 I. 13 eyes, that motion passes. And that will take us to item 33, which is Legistar 71102, appointments to the Common Council Executive Committee. President Furman. Move approval. Second. It's moved and seconded to approve. Is there objection, oh, Alder Carter? Alder Carter? Sorry, are we at the point of discussion? We are. Thank you. I do have, um, I, I want to provide contacts regarding the process since we're talking about process tonight. You know, whether we are in the physical or virtual chamber, we are elected officials in a place of history and tradition. 
We are here because of the voices of our residents thought we would represent them in the best way possible. And we should never take that vote of confidence for granted. We each cast one vote for leadership and that vote comes with expectations. Leadership has always appointed colleagues to the Common Council Executive Committee, formerly known as the Common Council Organizational Committee, to bring together a diversity of thoughts to the committee. President DeMar, Bevere, Badar, Balde, Abbas, and I tried to bring colleagues with diverse thoughts to the CC. EC table. However, current leadership chose to use the job interview format to further their, to um, interview their interested colleagues and to further their agenda. Questions like, tell us a little bit about yourself. Why are you interested in serving? What is your vision? What does empowerment and productivity mean? And finally, what measures you have taken to further your knowledge of racial justice, equity, and inclusion? I have to acknowledge that the sub subtle microaggression that implied that I didn't belong. When asked to take measures, when asked to, what measures you've taken to further your knowledge of racial justice, equity, and inclusion, I was led to wonder what lens is leadership looking through. I view these as culturally insensitive statements and words as a person of color, an African-American, a black woman, and as one of two first black women who have ran and was elected to the Common Council in its 100 year plus history. The interview questions by leadership on May 2nd took me back to Contingy Brown Jackson's confirmation. You don't belong with us. I hope that leadership in the future will never fall to this level and they will reflect on the meaning of tradition, respect, and the value of diversity of thought, which we all have and contribute to twice a month, all year long. Thank you. Thank you, Elder. Is there further discussion on item 33? Elder Miyadze. No, I wasn't going to say anything about this, but I, I tell you what, I'm starting to understand that what people are saying, the process was not done right. I totally agree you know, with uh, my colleague um, about the process not being done right. The interview, not only the, the questions, I mean, this was the worst interview that I've ever, ever been in. At the end of all, even the questioning, um, I was also asked on what on uh, certain things that I voted on, and the the chair made it pretty pretty uh, pretty uh, obvious that he was mad at the things that I voted on in the past uh, being on this council this year. So I think it's and and we were all given emails by Attorney House, which stated that uh, Progressive Dane. Uh, was holding meetings and violating quorum, but because of, of Alder mentioned that. So I think it's important that even the people that were selected, all Progressive Dane, that had already been collaborating itself on issues, violating this very system that's supposed to do things equitable. So this, the interview was conducted not to select people to move the city's agenda forward in an equitable process. So the way this was done, 
this interview was done, it was not done right. And I think that, Madam Mayor, I think it should be done again, and it should be done equitable. And I think the chair should not be able to, the president should not be able to, to, to do this, conduct this interview because it was not done right. I should not have been interrogated on why I voted for body cameras. I should not have been interrogated on why I voted down his uh, Mendota Drive uh, 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 and explain why. So I know I was not picked because of that reason. So I think this process should be done over again, given on who was chosen. So I think, Madam Mayor, I think it's important that you knew this because this process, when people talk about the process, it was not done right. Thank you. Thank you, Elder. Vice President Curry. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I had hoped to not make public comment about this, um, but feel the need to, especially due to a very um, big focus on the questions that were asked during the interview and process. Um, so I know the CCEC and its mission and purpose um, right now is governed through ordinance. Um, but as uh, President Firm and myself shared in our speeches, uh, nomination speeches, um, we, as well as others, um, have observed a need to shift. Um, and as policy influencers, and also I know it's a uh, Misleading by title of executive committee, but uh, CCEC is a, is a, not a recommending or not a, a, a governing body as we are. It is for recommendation. And a piece of, um, I think, what we're seeing right now is uh, lack of relationships, um, lack of understanding, lack of uh, communications outside of council. So we don't um, further waste folks' time who are waiting staff to give reports and answer questions. But in relation to the questions, um, I will actually take ownership for drafting all of the questions. Um, so I know equity and race has been centered, um, and I, it is very disheartening to hear that uh, folks, peers that look like me, felt like they were othered by this process and not included. Um, specifically speaking to the piece of equity and inclusion, um, not that it was a trick question, and I do remember mentioning this to some of the folks who were interviewed, um, but it's not, race obviously intersects with everything, and I can confidently say that as a person who has multiple intersectionalities, um, but it's not just about race, it's about Access. We've talked about going back in, in person and hybrid, and we've had folks talk about uh, disadvantages of those who are not as tech friendly or those who may have childcare transportation issues to be in person. And so I'd like to remind us all as a body to think about equity and inclusion, and not in, as the buzzwords that I think they've been thrown around um, within our BCCs, but really what do equity and inclusion mean? keeping a focal point on racial equity. Um, so I wanted to speak to that and encourage um, alders who uh, felt disparaged um, and discouraged because of this process to reach out directly. Um, I do feel that that is our role um, to not only yield that feedback, but to incorporate it. And so for it to happen on a public scene like this, don't really have a lot to respond to, um, but I would implore you all to please reach out, um, to please, again, remind yourself of why President Furman and I decided to run for these leadership positions this year, and also be open to not necessarily following tradition, especially in a system that has oppressed the voices of those who we're talking about. So, thank you. Thank you, Alder. I have no other alders in the queue on item 33. It's been moved and seconded. Is there objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing Alder Harrington McKinney. Please list me as a registered no. Will uh, list Alder Harrington McKinney as voting no. Alder Wahilahi. Thank you. Alder, no. there you go. 
All right, I'm gonna assume by the hands raised that we should list Alders Harrington McKinney, Wahila, Hay, Miadze, and Carter as, and Halverson as no's. I'm abstaining, thank you. Uh, Alder Carter would like to abstain, Alder Abbas. I will also abstain. Alders Abbas and Carter will abstain, Alders Miadze, Wahila, Hay, and Harrington McKinney will be noted as voting no. Unless there's further objection, all other alders will be noted as voting aye. And if my math is correct and the clerk can stop me, I believe that means the ayes have it. And confirming that's three no's, two abstentions, and the remainder are aye. That's correct. Okay. All right, so uh, item 33 passes. That takes us to item 62. Item 62 is Legistar 70899 uh, regarding uh, acquisition of land uh, for the construction of stormwater management facilities within the Mendota Grassman Greenway in the 19th Aldermanic District. Um, President Furman, a motion, please, on item 62. Move approval. Second. Moved and seconded to approve item 62. On item 62, are there questions for staff? Alder Harrington McKinney. Um, yes, um, I would just like to staff to give an overview because it's important as we um, move in the direction to know why um, uh, uh, stormwater um, management is critically important. So just a high level capsule view from staff. I'd appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, Alder. We have Janet Schmidt here from engineering. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. So a uh, quick overview is, um, this is part of the Strickers Mendota watershed study. So this is on the far west uh, side of town. Well, I, should, I shouldn't say far west. This is, on, this is closer um, to the Middleton side of town, um, off of University Avenue and Old Middleton Road area. So um, we had conducted a watershed study that is wrapping up and we're actually uh, working through the approval process to get that uh, placed on file. And uh, one of the key recommendations in this area was improvements to the greenway. So this is a greenway that um, routinely floods out some condos, uh, the Hickory Hollow condos. It also is in fairly poor condition. It is degraded significantly. Um, there's groundwater issues because it doesn't drain, uh, drain well and, and er erodes um, quite a bit. So the project is from uh, the greenway improvements from Old Middleton Road down to Lake Mendota. Again, it was a recommendation from our study, and this item in particular is to um, do the, the PLE and TLE, so that's permanent lim limited easements and temporary limited easements that we're going to need for construction of the Greenway. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Alder. Are there any further questions for staff? Seeing no further questions for staff, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we'll record that vote. That takes us to item 63, which is Legistar 70916, approving plans and specifications uh, and authorizing bids for the 2022 water main rehab uh, on Lake Mendota Drive. President Furman, a motion? Move approval. Second. It's moved and seconded to approve. Are there questions for staff? Seeing no questions for staff, is there discussion? Seeing no discussion, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of item 63. Which will bring us to item 71 which is Legistar 71037, approving plans and specifications and authorizing the Board of Public Works to advertise and receive bids for the Walnut Grove single track trail improvement. Uh, President Furman. Move approval. Second. Moved and seconded to approve. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, 
Yikes. President Furman. <laughs> Um, I, I just wanted to make sure Alder Conklin had a moment to. Um, oh, I'm uh, sorry. Yes. Alder Conklin, this is your time. <laughs> finally, finally, finally. <laughs> um, actually, what I really wanted to do is I actually wanted to make a motion to put this place this on file without prejudice. Um, this moved along a little bit quick, quicker than the parks department thought it would. And then we had a. Uh, um, uh, a PMI on Thursday, and there was obviously some opposing folks and some supportive folks. But um, with all those things in motion, and um, with Corey actually being out of the office for a while, um, Parks and I have really decided to just put this on the back burner for a while until we're able to, you know, just take in the, the public comments and, and really try to make sure that this is the best fit for the area. Um, so I, I would like to make a motion to place this on file without prejudice. And I hope that my colleagues will support me. Thank you, Alder. There's a motion to place on file without prejudice. Is there a second? Second. Alder Figueroa Cole will second. All right, so the motion before us is to place on file without prejudice. Is there discussion or questions? Seeing none, is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of placing on file without prejudice? Seeing no objection, that item is placed on file. That brings us to item 77, which is 70597, approving a land sale and agreements with Dane County to sell and develop portions of the Yahara Hills Golf Course as a future landfill compost site and sustainable business park and entering into a new solid waste agreement. Uh, President Furman, let's start with a motion, please. Sure, move adoption. Second. It's moved and seconded to adopt. I'm going to ask uh, our public works team lead, Charlie Romines, to just give us a brief overview. I know the hour is late um, and we have heard uh, about this. I hope you all had a chance to read the memo that was sent earlier, uh, but I would like um, the team lead to just give us a brief overview. Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, move through here just as quickly as I can. Um, just pro to provide a very brief background, the Rotefeld landfill, uh, where we've been uh, sending our waste as a city for nearly 40 years, is just north across 1218 from the current site. Um, it is on its last expansion, so it cannot, uh, they don't believe it will be able to accept waste beyond 2030. Uh, the county uh, currently operates a number of innovative programs there won't go in those uh, tonight. Um, I would point out though, the city currently has no other um, landfilling options should any delays result in a gap in the service uh, of landfilling by the county that would lead to very significant um, negative budgetary consequences. Um, the city's interest in the proposed site, um, a few points to go through. Um, it's important to note that the one of the unique things about this site um, compared to um, any other options that there, there could be out there. And, and Dane County hasn't been able to identify viable ones, uh, although they have been looking. In fact, I believe they've investigated three sites within the last month um, at request from the public. Um, it really comes down to the new sustainable business park, uh, the campus there, that uh, is really quite innovative. Um, I, I will leave that to questions if, if Alders, if, if you have questions on that tonight, but it, it really is uh, a rather exciting opportunity for the future. Um, the landfill um, would likely serve the city's needs for over 70 years. Uh, it keeps our tipping fees, our cost to use the landfill below state averages. Um, it's about a 230 acre proposed land sale. Uh, the price is above the appraised value. Um, it provides an opportunity to responsibly right size and reinvest, uh, reinvest in the golf enterprise. Uh, allows annex, uh, land annexation to the east of the current landfill. Um, some of the key points, I think, um, specific to tonight, um, approving the land sale now does not guarantee a landfill will be sited there. Um, the county actually has a lot more work to do. Um, also, the county could decide for any number of reasons that ultimately they don't want to put a landfill there. Um, 
Uh, I think a key point there is that we have negotiated in a buyback provision um, to allow for that, if whether through the uh, local negotiating process or some other reason uh, that the landfill doesn't take on that site, whether they can't draw permits or um, for whatever reason they move on, uh, we can buy back that, uh, that site through the end of 2024 for what the county is paying us. Um, and then also beyond 24, we just get a new appraisal. Um, and, and I think it's important to point out that local negotiating agreement is where all of the uh, area's uh, residents' concerns uh, beyond just not wanting a landfill on the site uh, are settled through that negotiation with the county. And the city will have the majority of the representation in that process. And I think when you couple that with the buyback prover, uh, provision, it really assures that our, our residents are not only uh, heard, but they get addressed. Um, some of the other issues that have been brought up is the lack of communication. And you know, certainly, I think even tonight, we've always heard you can always do more. Um, but there's been over about nine hours, I think, of presentations and resident question and answer from multiple in-person and virtual meetings uh, that's been posted to the county site and linked to by the city. I think another key point uh, for tonight would be that if the landfill is ultimately sited somewhere else in Dane County, it's highly unlikely um, to be able to meet our, our shared sustainability and environmental goals with the county. It's highly unlikely that the site's going to have the utility services required for a modern, modern landfill like the county currently operates, much less to then incorporate a sustainability, pardon me, a sustainability campus that lives up uh, to our shared values and environmental responsibility. Um, just a few points to pull out real quick, uh, key considerations through the negotiations we've had with Dane County at this point. Um, again, protecting the bottom line by keeping our cost to use landfill well below state averages. Right now, we spend about $2.8 million a year landfilling at the landfill. So uh, cost increases to haul or increased tipping fees can add up very quickly, and those are paid for out of general fund operating dollars. Again, that buyback agreement in combination with the local negotiations uh, provide for, I think, appropriate future leverage. The process is counterintuitive. It's very understandable. Um, usually you would say a, a sale of a land coupled with agreements between the city and the county would signal the end or a near end of the process. It's, it's actually not the case here. Um, there's quite a bit of work that the county actually needs to, to own the land to be able to continue to do. Um, and, and so that's why uh, delaying tonight um, really doesn't doesn't change as much as I think people would typically think it would. Um, also, the uh, this land sale uh, would allow if if um, council and uh, if elected officials choose to, to to allow for some financial sustainability for the golf course at Yahar Hills through at least 2042. Um, and again, that sale price per acre was higher than appraised value. I think for tonight, um, what I'll probably uh, close on and leave for questions is. It's important to understand what approval of the land sale tonight doesn't do. Um, as I mentioned, it doesn't guarantee a landfill will ever be sited on the property. Uh, there are a number of processes, permits, and procedures that are still required. Um, uh, and, and the county could decide for any reason not to, not to site the landfill there. Um, it doesn't prevent continued meaningful and required public processes. Um, as I've mentioned, and that lo locally negotiated agreement is required. It's important. Um, again, we have some leverage in that to make sure that our, our, our residents' needs are addressed. There's also a process called cont contested case. It's a very low threshold where um, people can file a, a case with the state. It typically delays the process for, I'm told, a year or two, but that again, uh, would require a furtherment of the process to, for residents to be allowed to do that. Um, a sale tonight does not pu end public engagement to build the best possible landfill. Um, and it doesn't prevent any interest group that may be forming. Um, it, they can still continue their efforts to either improve the proposed landfill or try to get it moved somewhere else. Um, so um, with that, I'll just you know, touch on uh, what the local negotiated agreement typically 
answers. And it's, it's about 85, 90% of the questions we're getting from residents beyond, you know, we just don't want our, want the landfill here. That is access and haul routes. So the big trucks moving around, that's mitigation of nuisances, um, uh, like odor uh, is probably the primary issue for this site. Um, procedures for reporting and correcting issues, hours of operation, days of operation, environmental monitoring, limitations to the site, final use of the site once it closes, and then property compensation, whether that is a guarantee of sale price when the owner sells their home or if there's to be an annual uh, annual payment. So um, a, there's a lot more process to come than I think would normally be thought of, as I mentioned, when you're when you're at a point of a sale and agreement. So um, with that, I'm happy to take questions um, on any portion of that or, or something else that, that you may have questions on related to the project. Thank you, Charlie. Questions for staff, Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, um, I do have a question for staff. And my question is, is that, um, uh, yes, we have, um, we could have done more. Thank you for recognizing that. But we've heard a lot of conversation. Some of it, some of it can be um, uh, rectified by your expl explanation. My question is, is that what is the, what would be the impact if tonight's um, amendment was referred? What would be, uh, if it was referred, what would be the impact? So if it was, if it was delayed? Um, yes, yes. Yeah, so, you know, I, I will freely admit that it is hard to conceive that a project that is probably seven years out from us starting to use, uh, that, that the thought that delaying a, a month or, or so now would be an issue. But, but part of the issue that the county has is a lot of the groundwork they have to do in order to get their permits has to be done during the growing season. So if we delay a month or two months or whatever it may be um, to allow for more conversations, um, what can happen is, is they bump into the winter and then, and then a lot of that work stops for five months uh, because of our winters here and sometimes our springs as we've just experienced. And so they're actually working on a very tight time frame, as, as unbelievable as that is, um, particularly when you factor in, it's, it's highly likely because of the very low threshold, you're gonna get a one to two year delay um, if people file a contested case. So what happens then, um, Alder Harrington McKinney, is it just makes it that much more likely that towards the end of this decade, the city is going to have some very expensive, um, it's gonna get very expensive for us to handle our trash. Um, is the most likely outcome. I, I can't. I can't weigh that it goes from won't happen to highly likely to happen. It just brings it more into the possibility that it could happen. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, when is uh, it appropriate to offer up a uh, a substitute? After we're finished with questions for staff. Thank you. Please come back to me during that time. Alder Conklin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> uh, my question is for staff also. Um, I know one of the public comments made a very good valid point um, about the effects on landfill children being raised by that and things. We've seen it uh, in Aaron Brockovich, uh, one of my favorite movies. So I'm just wondering, um, has there been any environmental studies or uh, anything to, as far as this uh, landfill here in this area. And my second part question to this is, does the county or the state have uh, some sort of stipulations in place saying like no homes can be built within 200 yards of the landfill or anything along those lines? So uh, if we get into highly technical conversation, I, I don't operate a landfill. Um, however, I've uh, spend a lot of time talking to a person who does. Um, the state has very strict requirements um, for operating modern landfills. And um, one of the things that will be discussed during the local negotiating process and is in place for the current landfill, for example, is monitoring water. Um, the, the landfill pays for very frequent 
uh, monitoring of, of well water and drinking water. Those results are sent directly to the residents in the potentially affected area. Um, and I believe I'm not speaking out of school. They've never had an issue with the current landfill operating in its current location for nearly 40 years. Um, I guess the other thing I would point out is that the, the first cell or two where they're looking at, at potentially siting at the current landfill or at the proposed landfill is actually the same distance or slightly further away from Madison residents than where they were filling at Rotefeld in 2010. So uh, I think that's important to keep in mind as well. I think the, the primary issue residents are gonna have is odor um, because they're just so far away otherwise from the landfill. Um, and Dane County's done a very nice job, you know, mitigating a lot of those nuisances, but they take odor serious, uh, drinking water very serious, blowing trash serious, rodent issues, um, there's a, a resident that lives right across the street from the landfill, just a few hundred yards away. Um, and he's actually been to a couple of the public information meetings and spoken, I would say, in glowing terms of the job the county has done in mitigating issues. And like I said, he, he lives like 200 yards away or so from basically their, their front door, if that helps at all. Okay, thank you. Um, one, one last follow up. Um, I believe that this was still the same one from the public comment, but they said something about how, you know, we're buying the horse before the carriage, basically. Um, you know, it doesn't quite have all its um, filings completed. I mean, it, can you speak to that? Is there any truth of that matter of like, we're just trying to buy this land, but we don't have other things in place? Yeah, that's what I was, I guess I was trying to get at with the process here is very counterintuitive. Um, there are certain things the county cannot do until they own the land. Um, and that's why in the, this list of agreements before you, not only is there the land sale with the buyback, but there's also the bill, the, the city will be able to continue to use the land exactly how it is for a dollar a year for the next two and a half years, essentially allowing the county to continue their work while allowing us to use the land as we, we have. Um, because they can only go so far before they before they own the land. So I'm not disputing um, what the public uh, commenter said. I think it's it's probably not wrong, but it's also just the process of citing a landfill, which I, if I recall correctly, hasn't happened in the state for 25 or 30 years. So it's not a process that's well understood or undertaken very often. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elder. Are there any additional questions for staff? Seeing none, it's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Uh, Vice President Curry. Thank you. Um, I would actually defer to Alder Harrington McKinney and um, go next, if that's okay with you, Mayor. Alder Harrington McKinney. I'd like to offer a substitute, an amendment, I'm sorry, which which one? Help me, Mayor. I, I don't know, Alder. I don't know what you're trying to do. So what I'm trying to do is get this referred to um, the um, June the 2nd council meeting, and I can speak to that if I can get a second. All right, so the Alder would like to move a substitute motion to refer to June 2nd. Is there a second? The 21st, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, the 20, June 21st? Second. It's been moved and seconded to refer to the June 21st council meeting, Alder Harrington McKinney. That is correct, Madam Mayor. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, the reason that I'm uh, recommending a referral because of all that we have heard tonight, um, I believe that it is um, irresponsible for the city to move forward without having the opportunity for some community education. And just as we were educated about what is so and what's not so, it appears that that uh, was not offered to communities surrounding our area. And it would be irresponsible, for I think, for us to be moving forward with um, 
without having that opportunity. And I believe that you said if we're not moving into the winter months, which I'm not suggesting, but I am suggesting that we have ample opportunity to have community better community education around this sale and purchase. Thank you, Alder. So the motion is to refer. Can we just? I, I'm. I just like to ask for one clarification because I I heard your answer, Charlie, but I didn't hear a specific number of months that would be impactful. Is it? Um, that's a month and a half referral. Uh, get them into the range where we'd be delayed. Um. You know, it's it's weather, right? So it's hard to say for certain. Um, a delay just makes it more likely that they won't be able to do the groundwork they need to get done before winter. Um, and if they don't get it done before winter, then there's certain certain permits and certain thresholds they won't be able to cross until the following spring. So it is it is very difficult for me to say with certainty that a four or six week delay how impactful that will be, what ripples that will cause. Um, but I would just say, you know, we've had a number of public information meetings and there's a lot of information that has been shared. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that. And, leave and that Charlie, back. you were, uh, I mean, you, you alluded to the fact that this, the potential consequence of delay is a, a high cost to the city. Can you say more about that, please? So the two nearest landfills to the city are 45 miles each way, 90 miles round trip. Um, one of them would require an act of their city council to consider taking us on. Um, and I think in either case, we would be looking at uh, probably around a $2 million increase um, in our cost to haul and tip trash if we had to consider another option whether that was because there was a gap in service while the county was getting their new landfill stood up either at this site or somewhere else, or if the land or if the county just isn't able to continue in the landfilling business. So it would get very serious, very quick towards the end of the decade. And that's it. That's $2 million annually. Correct. Yep. Out of general fund. Yep. Dollars. Thank you. Alder Evers. Thank you, Mayor. I will not be supporting the referral. Um, I'll just note in, in the uh, memo that uh, Charlie shared with us earlier today, um, approving the sale now does not prevent further meaningful public engagement and in fact is a pre excuse me, prerequisite for the most meaningful component of it, the locally negotiated agreement. Selling the land now does not prevent the group organizing regarding the project from pursuing their ends as the county could still choose not to cite the landfill at Yohara, in which case the city can simply buy the land back. The land sale now does best protect the city against the likelihood of landfill service disruption later this decade that would have significant negative budgetary consequences. Council members, let's trust staff in this. There, this is not a, a, a vote that there's there's a back door to this vote, and voting for this sale does not does not is is not the final word that about the siting of of the next landfill. It creates the possibility and the next step for that happening, and uh, I think it's important for us to acknowledge the work that's been done, and I. I'll close by saying I appreciated very much the order for the district, uh, the work that she put into this, the difficulty she came to the positions she has right now, but her support is meaningful and I will not be uh, uh, joining in on any move for the referral. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter? Yeah, so we still um, be able to question for staff. Uh, if you'd like to go back to questions, is there any objection? Not seeing any. Go ahead, Alder. Um, I just have one question for you, Charlie. You you told us what the process is 
all the steps that the county has to go through. I'm assuming that you're meeting with the county. It was more important that you are meeting with the county and understand the process that they're, they have to go through. How does that intersect with the community, surrounding communities, McFarland, et cetera, um, and getting the information to them so they have a better understanding of what's going on? Sure. So I, I can tell you that Director Welch and uh, they have sent postcards um, for at, le at least the last two PEMs into the village of McFarland, including to the school district. Um, and that that public information, those those meetings will continue. That education will consider will continue. It'll continue to be led by the county, and 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 I will continue to support that as as needed with without question. Um, as far as uh, I'll speak in a little more detail to the local negotiating agreement. So by state um, requirements, any municipality within 1500 feet of the edge of waste has a seat at the table. Um, how many seats depends on the overall impact and how much frontage you have. Um, it's my anticipation that in this process, the city of Madison would have four seats. And the town of Cottage Grove would have one. Now, if the city and the town agree, an additional seat can be put at the table for the village of McFarland uh, to have an official seat at the table for that local negotiated process. Those meetings are public. Um, so the public can be there and, and have, uh, have a participation in that. Uh, those are not private uh, discussions. So, so there's a lot more to come on this. I, I hope I've answered the question. I don't want to rattle on if, if I have. No, I, I think you have. And, and my concern is as each, each level or each level that they have to go through to make sure that this is what is best for the county, et cetera, and, and approvals, that there is some kind of outreach letting the residents know what is happening and also what you were telling us if it doesn't work out then we can buy it back but i just want to make sure that the residents are uh, informed at each level absolutely thank you thank you other vice president curry Thank you, Mayor. Um, I feel compelled to speak as this is within my district. I also want to give a disclaimer. I don't know if my internet is unstable, but cameras are going in and out. So please let me know if you all can't hear me um, or I get blurry. Um, I did send out a uh, message um, to all alders um, after the memo from Superintendent Romines. Um, just wanted to highlight a couple of things because I know both the memo and the email were a bit wordy. Um, this has been a very challenging issue um, for me based on, I think, the shared empathy that several of my peers um, have shared with myself and I think any concerned uh, person about um, impacts to those uh, within residential areas that are nearby the current landfill as well as the new proposed sites. Um, but there's also confusion and I believe a lot of misinformation that has entered the narrative based on this being a county-led project with the city supporting and so um, I, I did acknowledge and I will acknowledge here as well publicly that um, you know, I, I talk a lot about engagement and, and communications. Um, I do wish that more proactive communications during the planning process had occurred. So the education and public information meetings were less of a notification type style and more of a this is coming. This is what we're thinking of. This is a site, you know, and getting um, proactive uh, feedback in that manner. Um, but we can't reverse time and go back there. Um, based on the information that I am aware of by both sides, as well as communicating um, with folks in the village, villages of you know, town of Cottage Grove and village of McFarland. Um, I have not been, I would love to be able to say, let's delay this tonight. Um, but I have, I do not have a concrete plan or proof of what would be achieved within a delay. 
Um, I do have to applaud uh, Superintendent Romines and his staff as a supporting partner of this project, going above and beyond. I think we mentioned over nine hours of, of public comment, hybrid accommodations, um, so being in person and virtual. Um, I think there was a comment at the last meeting I attended where a resident said she actually learned far too much about, far more about landfills that she ever intended to. Um, but obviously, anyone within the vicinity of residents we've heard from would have a concern. Um, they deal with the current landfill. I think all of us can empathize with that and I have deep sympathy there. Um, but again, uh, there are communications, actions in the works. There have been acknowledgement that missteps have occurred. Um, I, I, I know that this is part of the democratic process, and so I also applaud my constituents for organizing and bringing perspectives, canvassing and getting the word out. Um, I do want to implore us to continue thinking about actual engagement versus notification um, in all of our city processes, especially ones where all of us can walk away tonight and say six months isn't a long amount of time in tangent, but it will be forever for the folks that live in this area and will deal with impacts that none of us, I think, in this space right now can. Um, so again, I wrote an email um, that made some points known. I'm also going to public publish a blog um, because I do think it is very important to make some of those distinctions between city and county processes as well as be transparent about some of the provisions that have been built in to protect and uh, amplify concerns and uh, mitigations that we can employ for city residents, which is our calling here as the city of Madison Common Council. So I would encourage uh, my peers to not delay this land sale, but allow it to go through tonight so conversations and negotiations can continue and we can continue to receive feedback that hopefully will mitigate and present the best plan amicably as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Curry. I have no further alders in the queue. The motion that's before us right now is referral. Uh, based on the conversation, I'm gonna suggest we do a roll call. So all those in favor of referral, aye. Those opposed, no, as your name is called and the clerk will please call the roll. And Wahelia. No. Wahelia, no. Abbas. No. Abbas, no. Alvarez. No. Alvarez, no. Benford. No. Benford, no. Bennett is excused. Carter. Come back to me. Conklin. No. Conklin, no. Curry. No. Sorry, Vice President Curry, no. Evers. No. Evers, no. Figueroa Cole. No. Figueroa Cole, no. Foster. No. Foster, no. President Furman. No. President Furman, no. Halverson. No. Halverson, no. Harrington McKinney. Aye. Harrington McKinney, aye. Heck. No. Heck, no. Lemmer. No. Lemmer, no. Martin. No. Martin, no. Miazzi. No. Miazzi, no. Verveer. No. Verveer, no. Vitiver. No. Vitiver, no. Carter. Aye. Carter, aye. I have 17 no, two aye. With 17 no's, the motion fails. We're back to the main motion, which is to adopt. Is there further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, is there objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Alder Wahili. Roll call. Uh, roll call is requested. The motion is to adopt. Alder Harrington McKinney, is that the same request? That's the same request, Madam Mayor. All right, thank you. Um, the motion is to adopt. All those in favor, aye. Those opposed, no, as your name is called. And I'll ask the clerk to call the roll again. Wahelia. No. Wahelia, no. Abbas. Aye. Abbas, aye. Alvarez. Yes. Alvarez, aye. Benford. Aye. Benford, aye. Bennett is excused. Carter. 
Aye. Carter I. Conklin. Aye. Conklin I. Vice President Curry. Aye. Vice President Curry I. Evers. Aye. Evers I. Figueroa Cole. Aye. Figueroa Cole I. Foster. Aye. Foster I. President Furman. Aye. President Furman I. Halverson. Aye. Halverson I. Harrington McKinney. No. Harrington McKinney, no. Heck. Aye. Heck, I. Lemmer. Aye. Lemmer, I. Martin. Aye. Martin, I. Miazzi. Aye. Miazzi, I. Verveer. Aye. Verveer, I. Vitiver. Aye. Vitiver, I. If 17, I. Two, no. 17 eyes, that motion passes. And that will take us to item 81, which is Legistar 70872, amending the capital budget to transfer funds from uh, reconstruction streets to right of way landscaping to allow the conversion of medians. President Furman. Um, move adoption of substitute. I'm sorry, move approval of substitute. I can't. There's a motion and second of the substitute. Are there questions? Is there discussion? Alder Halverson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this is something that I voted against at the Board of Public Works. Uh, I felt that uh, spending $265,000 to say $78,000, and I know it's been substituted to a smaller amount, I think 97000 or something in that round. Um, after we spent several hundred thousand dollars um, of trying to put these medians to the place that they are now and numerous months of feedback, it just didn't make sense to me. It feels like we're going in the wrong direction. Um, and I know this had come out of the last budget period, um, but uh, I feel like that was... Uh, not the right cut for us to make. So I will not be supporting this. Thank you, other other figure of call. Alder figure of call. There you go. No. Is there further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, it, the motion is to adopt the substitute. Is there objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of the substitute? Alder Halverson would like to be recorded as voting no. Alders, uh, Alder Abbas? A roll call vote, please. A roll call is requested. The motion is to adopt the substitute. Alder Wahila, is that a different request? No. no. Okay. The motion is to adopt the substitute. All those in favor, aye. Those opposed, no. As your name is called, then the clerk will please call the roll. My apologies, Wahelia. No. Wahelia is no. Abbas. No. Abbas is no. Alvarez. Aye. Alvarez says aye. Benford. No. Benford is no. Bennett is excused. Carter. Come back to me. Conklin. Conklin. Aye, sorry. <clears throat> Conklin is aye. Vice President Curry. Aye. Vice President Curry is aye. Ever is aye. aye. Evers is aye. Figueroa Cole. Aye. Figueroa Cole is aye. Foster. Aye. Foster is aye. President Furman. Aye. President Furman is aye. Halverson. No. Halverson is no. Harrington McKinney. No. Harrington McKinney is no. Heck. Sorry? Aye. Heck is I, Lemmer. Aye. Lemmer is I, Martin. Aye. Martin is I, Miazzi. No. Miazzi is no, Verveer. Aye. Verveer is I, Vitiver. Aye. Vitiver is I, returning to Carter. Carter? Aye. Carter is I. 
I have six no. Thirteen I. With thirteen eyes, the budget amendment fails, and that will take us to item eighty-two, uh, which is Legistar seven zero. I'm sorry, Alder Figueroa Cole. So, what does that mean then? What is the when that fails? Okay, it's a budget amendment. It requires 15 votes. The amendment failed. Right. So that means what happens to the project itself? It's not going to happen. We're going to continue. The mediums are going to stay the way they are. And not so although it's, this is, it's not properly in order to discuss this now. Um, but since I imagine it's of interest, the short version is we will stick with the budget as written, um, which means there is not funding for um, the maintenance of these medians, the conversion to concrete will go forward because that is funded, um, but these medians will not be maintained for this year because that funding doesn't exist. Thank you for the clarification. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Alder. Uh, all right, so then on to item 82, which is Legistar 70887. Uh, authorizing an amendment to the water utility capital budget to include additional budget authority uh, in support of various things regarding uh, well 15 P PFAS treatment and uh, awarding a sole source engineering contract to AECOM. President Furman. Move adoption. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt on item 82. Are there questions? Is there discussion? Is there objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of item 82? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of item 82. And that will take us to item 92. Alders, I'll just request in the future that we not pull items that we're not gonna ask questions or discuss on. Uh, item 92 is Legistar 70988, directing staff to proceed with uh, renovations at 2002 Zaya Road uh, and amending the app, the adopted capital budget to authorize additional general obligation borrowing. Uh, President Furman. Move adoption. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt item 92. Are there questions for staff? Is there discussion? Is there objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of item 92? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of item 92. That brings us to item 98, which is Legistar 70654, amending the Ahar Hills Neighborhood Development Plan. President Furman. Move adoption. Second. It's moved and seconded to adopt. Are there questions for staff? Aldo Wahile. I had a 96 also. Or Although we dealt with 96 oh, okay, okay. first. Yes. yes, sorry. Questions for staff on item 98? Seeing none, uh, discussion on item 98? Seeing none, is there objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of item 98. That brings us to item 106, which is Legistar 71014, uh, amending resolution 6166, which uh, regarded the older work group to develop logistics and operational details for the Madison Police Department independent civilian oversight. Uh, President Furman. Move adoption. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt. Are there questions for staff? Alder Harrington McKinney. Yes, uh, I would like the staff to just summarize and tell us what's before us. I think probably uh, Attorney Lawton. Uh, attorney, you're muted. 
myself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what this does is it updates some of the language from when this was originally passed. Um, as you can see here, some of the dates are talking about 2020 dates. That's when this first went into effect. As you know, members, uh, their terms end on the board. So we took out that language that references past events. So you'll see um, talking about instead of September 29th, 2020, it's the next available meeting. So that makes um, this more in line with what's going to happen in the future. The other thing we took out um, is adopting the report of the work group as policy of the city. Um, it's important for everyone to know we did not change anything in that work group report. So all we did was change it as adopting as the official policy of the city. So that work group report still stands as it was written. There was nothing changed in there. Thank I, you. I, have a, I have a follow up question to uh, staff. I just wanna make sure that I'm clear. Um, the only items that was changed was updating the dates nothing else was changed within that document is that what you are you are sharing we we changed the dates and then we took out that it was adopted as official policy of the city but the work group report itself was a solitary report and that report still stands we are we are not negating or doing away with that report so help me to understand, I guess I'm confused. I'm slow on the uptake, it's late. What do you mean by the policy of the city? What, what do you mean by that? So, so you'll see in the original resolution, they adopted the um, work group report is official policy of the city. And? So we, that has come out. So the report of the work group is is, is not still the there. Policy is not the policy of the city, right? It, because solitary reports, if you look at two point two seven, um, when the council receives a solitary report, shall adopt, accept, or place the report on file. If it adopt it, so we're not we're not adopting the report as policy of the city. We're accepting the report. Okay, I see that um, Attorney Haas popped on. So please clarify me because it's I'm still seems like there's a missing gap. And help me. I know it's late, but maybe it's just missing something. Sure, sure. I, I think. Um, what Attorney Lawton is uh, alluding to is the fact that there was, if you recall, there was a change in the ordinance regarding solitary reports. The council used to have options to accept or adopt the report. And then that ordinance was changed to, to eliminate this confusion related to adopting means it now becomes a policy of the city. Now solitary reports are only accepted and any action related to the report has to be adopted as a separate uh, resolution or ordinance. And so in this case, we we're, um, we were merely changing that, updating this resolution so that final report of the work group is accepted. Um, and uh, as you recall, the, this report had to do with the creation of the uh, Civilian Oversight Board and the members that were to be um, appointed, the categories, the racial identifications of those members. And so 
uh, the, the language of this resolution was was merely changed to to be consistent with the current ordinance about accepting solitary reports. The other ordinance, which was adopted on the consent agenda, is related to this, as we've discussed before. Uh, there's some questions about language in that ordinance and in the work group report. Um, and whether or not that language was constitutional. And so our recommendation was that the language of the, both the ordinance and the resolu resolution should be modified so we can remove any legal questions about the legality of both of those documents. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. I brought that up because the, uh, the writers of the amendment was very specific in terms of not altering any of the language. And I just wanted to make sure that I heard that uh, because there was a lot of discussion back and forth about the, uh, uh, the, um, the uh, amendment of the document was to be accepted with no um, amendments or changes. And so I wanted to make sure that I understood where that separation was, is. Yeah, I can confirm we are not changing any of the language in that report. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Are there any further questions on item 106? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Mark me as abstaining, please. We'll mark Alder Harrington McKinney as abstaining. With that exception, we'll record a unanimous vote. All right, so that brings us to uh, introductions from the floor for referral, President Furman. Sure, move introduction of legislative file number 71355, amending the title of section 33.13, amending section 33.13.1 and repealing section 33.13.2 related to the Common Council Executive Committee. Refer to Common Council Executive Committee on May 24th and the Common Council on May 24th. Second. It's moved and seconded to introduce. Is there objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing none, that item is introduced and referred. President Furman. Move introduction of legislative file number 71357, creating section 3.035 related to the Common Council Office and Chief of Staff. Refer to Common Council Executive Committee May 24th and the Common Council on May 24th. Second. Moved and seconded to introduce and refer. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing none, that item is reduced, uh, is introduced and referred. President Furman. Move introduction of legislative file number 71395, by title only, appointing placeholder as alder for District 3 until spring 2023 election. Refer to Common Council Executive Committee meeting on May 17th and the Common Council on May 24th. Second. Moved and seconded to introduce and refer. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing none, that item is introduced and referred. Is there any further business? Yes, uh, happy birthday to Alder Verveer. And um, thank you and congratulations to Alder Alburis uh, for whom this is your last meeting. We will miss you. Alder Wahilahe, it is your turn. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Second. Moved and seconded to adjourn. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of adjournment? Seeing no objection, we are adjourned. Uh, good morning, everyone. <laughs>